Hi, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. This is episode 267, and today I'm going to be talking with Levant Laszlo about his new translation project for translating all of the remaining ancient Greek astrological texts from the Hellenistic and Byzantine astrological traditions. So today is August 11th, 2020, starting at exactly 1.15 p.m. in Denver, Colorado. Uh, so hey, Levant, welcome back to the show. Hi, thank you for having me again. Yeah, so this is your second time on the show. The last time was a few years ago when we did an episode together talking about the early history and the origins and some of the mysteries surrounding horary astrology. Um, what must have been like three years ago now, I think, right? Oh, well, why? Yeah, I said two years and a half, maybe. Okay. Uh, so, in the meantime, you've been working on. Um, your background, and you've recently launched a new translation project called the Horai Project in order to basically crowdfund the translation of the remaining ancient astrological texts from ancient Greek um, through people supporting you on Patreon, right? That's right, yes. I just launched it a couple of months ago, and it is still a sort of a beta testing because um, there is no web page for the project, um, a dedicated uh, web page that I mean. Uh, but um, I'm just translating texts, and I'm trying to organize, and I'm trying to expand you know, the horizon of this um, this translation project. Brilliant! And um, so far, it's it seems like it's going really well. You've already got a decent bit of patrons, and you're 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 trying to go for certain funding goals, so that basically, if you're able to reach these goals in the next few months, you can um, fund the project and and translate texts all the time, basically, right? Well, yes. Um, basically, um, if I can reach this goal, I can I can spend um, uh, more time uh, translating this text, and that maybe I can I can uh, maintain this uh, current release date of the the first of September. And of course, uh, if uh, more support comes, then I can I can even broaden the horizon of this. So uh, maybe I can I can uh, um, obtain some some sort of manuscripts that are really um, uh, difficult to obtain and uh, you need to pay a um, um, hefty sum for for getting them so I would like to see what what uh, what sort of um, uh, outcome it can have okay great so I want to talk um, today about some of the text because you've actually been really busy since you launched this project not that long ago in the past few months and you've translated and already, Released several texts, and I'll put links to them. We're going to discuss four of these translations that you've either completed or in the process of doing, and I'll put links to them in the description below this episode, either below the video on the YouTube version or on the Astrology Podcast website for those listening to the audio version, so that they can read along with some of these texts that you're you're actually releasing. Um, but first, before we get to that, let's talk a little bit about your background and just introduce people to you to talk about your credentials. So, you're actually a classical philologist uh, from Hungary, and you're working on your PhD right now, right? That's right. Yes, um, I expect to finish my PhD next year. So, what is still ahead is to to complete my thesis. Um, the title of my thesis that was mentioned in the, in, uh, in the previous interview with me. Is the astrological inceptions of the Emperor Zeno's um, um, anonymous astrologer, and um, these are the well-known cases of uh, the, uh, the stolen linen of a slave girl and and some voyages on the on the sea and uh, and the taming of uh, the, of the small lion. So I'm just uh, working on a, on a new critical edition of these texts, and and it uh, is going to be so. My thesis is going to be also sort of a comprehensive introduction to the astrological astrological branch of uh, inceptions in general. Okay, so that's exciting. Yeah, and also there is another question that, um, um, according to my research, and uh, this uh, this is something I, I just deem to be important, is that um, um, the, the the astrologer, the astrological author, who is uh, called uh, Reitorius of Egypt, and uh, whose um, um, compendium uh, was published and translated in, in, into English in, in some form. So this um, compendium was actually, and this is my thesis, was uh, actually written by this anonymous astrologer of, uh, of the Emperor Zeno. So Reitorius should be another person who lived a little bit earlier. 
But of course, I, this is not uh, the topic of this uh, conversation at the moment. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Well, the so the emperor, that astrologer, the anonymous astrologer who worked for the emperor Zeno, lived in the fifth century. And um, one of the things I remember Pingree mentioned about him is something about um, the emperor or emperors around that time maybe using their secret service in order to get the birth data of other rivals to the throne and things like that. Yeah, it is highly possible, but. Um, Actually, we only know um, two um, certain cases that are nativities. So one of them is um, is uh, the unknown and uh, the unnamed uh, son of the uh, Emperor Leo the First, and the other one was a uh, um, 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 political rival of uh, Zeno, who was uh, the poet and philosopher Pomprepius of uh, Panopolis. But uh, there are some other um, uh, fifth century nativities that can be dealt with. So I'm I'm just uh, trying to build up a, a full argument why these um, uh, other nativities should also be assigned to this uh, mysterious figure. Okay. So um, a large part of your approach, there's some. While well, there was a lot of texts that have been translated in the past by different, either um, classic scholars or by people from Project Hindsight like Robert Schmidt or Robert Hand. Um, there's a number of texts that haven't been translated, and it seems like your focus, you're, you're going back and translating some things that, that have been translated already, but some of your focus is not just translating from critical editions, but actually going back and looking at the manuscripts um, that are not printed, that are still in handwritten form in ancient Greek, and translating from those, because sometimes that contains Additional information that the critical edition leaves out. Yeah, um, well, yeah, this is too true partly because there are some critical editions that are are faulty, um, um, insofar as uh, they don't uh, really include all the all the um, available um, manuscript witnesses, and these uh, manuscript witnesses should also be consulted. But there are some other texts that have never been edited in in uh, critical editions, um, and there are these. Um, so there are many reasons for for this uh, for this lack of of editions. But uh, but uh, these can be really important texts in some cases. So sometimes, um, um, you know, the, so the, the the logic behind um, um, editing or publishing critical editions was just. Uh, there was an author whose uh, name was known, and uh, there was a critical edition missing, and uh, there was someone who had the time and energy and the, uh, um, and could be paid for for making the critical edition. But uh, if uh, it came to be some anonymous but um, um, some highly important text from an astrological perspective, they could be um, just overlooked very easily. Just because um, uh, there was no reason for the for the scholars to to edit them, right? So with a critical edition, the scholar sometimes would take all the surviving manuscripts or a bunch of the sur surviving manuscripts and then try to reconstruct what they thought the original text was. Um, but in some instances, these reconstructions themselves might be faulty, right? That's right. Um, well. Um, astrological texts are not like um, um, like uh, fine literature, like uh, poetry. Um, so the, we we can't really uh, expect uh, these uh, texts uh, uh, to be um, untouched uh, for for uh, many centuries. So these were um, in the course of the of the centuries they were adapted to the um, to the actual needs of the uh, the readers. Sometimes shortened, sometimes expanded, sometimes modified or updated. So um, there are different versions coming from different eras, and we must know that uh, the earliest um, uh, Byzantine manuscript uh, that um, is extant is uh, from the tenth or eleventh uh, centuries. So um, there are about. Uh, Five six hundred years between the, uh, the the original versions and the first um, attested versions of the, some kind of text, right? So, so even though somebody like like Ptolemy or Valens wrote their text originally in the second century, the earliest versions of those texts that survive only date to like the ninth or tenth century, and that's or even because later. yes, or even later, and that's because they were all. Individual scribes had to sit down with the text and and copy it by hand, 
And so what we have by the time you get to the 10th century are just copies of copies of copies. And sometimes if there's an error or something gets inserted into the text that the scribe thought was interesting, then the texts diverge and can start looking very different. Yeah, uh, this is yeah, this is part of the story, and also these uh, these texts um, uh, uh, survived in 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 uh, collections in anthologies. So sometimes there are some portions copied from one one uh, uh, book uh, into a uh, into a compendium, and some in some other form they are co- they are copied into another compendium, and uh, it's just um, chasing a willow wisp to. Uh, to to set a goal to the reconstruct the original structure of uh, of some text. So all we can do is uh, going back to the earliest uh, reconstructable version and to put these versions uh, next to each other to see um, what what sort of um, of uh, of uh, uh, conclusions we can draw from from uh, this comparison. Sure. Yeah, and it's interesting that sometimes some of these texts, the compilations you mentioned, are these astrologer um, scholars living in the medieval period or the late med- medieval period, just um, going through these collections and copying down excerpts from texts that they thought thought were interesting, and then they would compile like a whole um, you know list of different excerpts from different authors rather than just one continuous text. Of course, yeah, that was the that was the normal practice. So uh, it was like um, uh, setting up a notebook or a collection. So sometimes there were some some scholars, for example, Isaac Argyris, who who compiled his his own um, um, handbook from different sources. Okay, so um, all that being said, what so so your goal at this point is to translate. Um, all of the remaining Hellenistic and Byzantine ancient Greek astrological texts, what texts haven't been translated yet, or what um, what are you looking at doing in the future? Well, there are many different types of texts that haven't been translated or even edited. Um, for example, there are some authors whose um, whose um, uh, texts uh, haven't been uh, translated so far, even though there there are some uh, editions, um, some semi-critical editions. Uh, most notably, for example, uh, Maximus of Ephesus, whose uh, uh, poem uh, titled "On Inceptions" haven't been translated so far. Okay, this um, is not a, not a complete poem because uh, only portions of this poem have survived, but. Uh, but there are some um, exhaustive um, um, epitomes of uh, of the text, so we can we can have an, an, a nice overview of the content. And uh, another um, example could be Anubium, for example, the uh, the first century astrological um, uh, poet, uh, whose uh, tra- fragments have been uh, re-edited uh, recently, and uh, this could be also translated. But um, uh, which is possibly even more interesting is that there are some, so there are a lot of um, of uh, practical horoscopes like uh, casebook nativities or casebook inceptions uh, from the Byzantine era that haven't been um, edited or translated, and maybe they can shed some light on on the actual usage of uh, techniques. And um, uh, one of my primary plans is to to uh, so bring them uh, to the audience uh, uh, as soon as possible, and and uh, there are a vast amount of uh, of um, anonymous texts uh, dealing with inceptions, uh, dealing with um, with uh, interrogations. So these are um, this is Arabic uh, astrology uh, astrology basically translated from Arabic to Greek, and um, some some um, uh, texts. Uh, uh, dealing with uh, nativities, so well, it is very very difficult to assess the the amount of the volume of these texts uh, that are still untranslated because, as I said, it, there are some compendia, and uh, these um, compendia sometimes uh, contain the same chapters from from different um, uh, collections. Uh, but uh, we can imagine that there are some thousands or even tens of thousands pages still awaiting for translation. Okay, so there's there's plenty that needs to be translated, and one of the things I like is that as you're doing some of these translations, you're immediately 
releasing um, to your patrons through Patreon some of the work in progress so that the people that are your supporters can actually start reading some of this stuff right away and start understanding the process that you're going through in translating it or giving you feedback uh, or comments or notes. And um, that's been a really interesting process to watch over the past few months. Um, and you've already gotten a few texts that are, are um, near finished or are in a form where you're ready to release uh, working editions as uh, PDFs. And there's four of them that I want to go over with you today. That's okay. Yes. Uh, well, I, I chose this uh, this uh, uh, this form of uh, publishing texts instead of um, of uh, uh, publishing books in ready format, because uh, so these are not not works and in, in the form as uh, people just imagine them. So there are some some uh, collections and and some different versions of the same. Um, uh, chapter, for example, or the same text or, or the same topic, and and sometimes um, um, there are better manuscripts that haven't been mapped so far. But uh, of course, I can't um, have access to all of the available manuscripts. So sometimes I just uh, discover some new manuscripts containing some surprising information or or, or better reading. So. Um, if if I just wait un until I can I can say that okay now everything is fine so it is finished and and the translation is all also impeccable then maybe so we can, I can finish it in fifty years or so. Okay, that's that sounds like a, a good plan. Um, all right, so the the four texts that we're going to talk about today that you've released and that I'll put links to the PDF um, in the description page for this episode. The first one. Is Antiochus and Porphyry and their early work defining basic concepts in early Hellenistic astrology. Uh, the second one is Rhetorius on the systematic interpretation of nativities. The third is Rhetorius on inceptions, which is a, a summary of how to do electional astrology. And then the fourth is uh, Shadan's discourses with Abu Mashar on the secrets of astrology. So um, let's start talking about Antiochus and Porphyry. So I suggested this as being like a useful starting point because it's an early work of definitions, and other um, other people have started with this or worked on this text, like Robert Schmidt. But you've been finding a lot of new manuscripts lately that other earlier translators and, and critical editions didn't take into account. So you felt like you could put kind of a fresh take on this text, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, well, um, the edition of this text uh, was published in 1940 um, in one volume of the CCAG, um, and and uh, the editors only relied on on three um, main manuscripts as a basis. Uh, but uh, there have been some research, not by me, but uh, some Spanish scholars uh, regarding the manuscripts um, containing the. Anonymous uh, commentary to Ptolemy's Apotelesmatics, and uh, these uh, manuscripts happen to 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 contain also this uh, introduction to to Ptolemy, uh, written by Porphyry, according to the title of uh, of this text in this version, and um, they they found that, that there are some other manuscript uh, branches that are also um, important to to be able to reconstruct the the um, the uh, immediate ancestor of uh, of this uh, of this version, and I also tried to to um, to map these uh, manuscripts and to discover these manuscripts, and I also incorporated some of these readings uh, into into my translation. And I also found some other um, uh, versions of this text. Um, actually, I, I wrote an, uh, an article about this topic uh, three years ago, and it's still waiting for for uh, publication at uh, Classical Philology. Maybe <laughs> next year it will come out. Um, so uh, this is um, this is another version which um, which uh, doesn't assign this this uh, this uh, text to to Porphyry. So it is anonymous. Uh, it is anonymous uh, uh, text and. Uh, here it is um, just a part of a, of a larger uh, compilation that is uh, that hasn't that doesn't have a, a title, but uh, the, the the first uh, couple of words uh, say that on the celestial disposition. So I just uh, call this text on, on the celestial disposition. So OCD, 
And uh, this um, text version gives um, a slightly different version than the, the, the porphyry manuscripts give. And it also raised my doubt uh, regarding the authorship of, of porphyry um, of, the, of this text, because uh, this is um, not really porphyry style, how this uh, text is written. And it's also, so this uh, the introduction to, to Ptolemy's apotalismatics is a, is a, is a collection of, the, of uh, texts of different origin. And the main core of this text is a, is a summary or an adaptation from uh, Antiochus of Athens. And um, so it, it, is, it is possible that, of course, Porphyry was the, um, the author in the third century, but equally possible that it, was, it, it has nothing to do with Porphyry at all, even though it was, uh, it was written sometime before the fourth century. So between the second and the fourth century. Okay, so so you chose to translate only the portions from the quote unquote porphyry text that can that clearly go back to the original work of definitions by Antiochus of Athens, who lived in the first or second century, and um, so you've translated all the different versions of that basically in this document. And what it ends up being then is a, is a list of basic definitions of fundamental concepts in ancient astrology. So there's a few of those that I wanted to go through today, a few of the definitions that I thought were more interesting just to give people like a taste of the text or a preview of the text and what they're going to they're going to find. Um, so we're releasing the full PDF and the full PDF will be out there in the link in the description once I release this episode. Um, but here's the working sort of word document and what the PDF will look like. So um, the first definition I wanted to look at is um, the very first one that you translated. It's just on diurnal and nocturnal stars. So I'm going to go ahead and read it. So this is from Porphyry's version. Yeah. Well, actually, what I call Porphyry's version is uh, both um, the version of uh, of the of the manuscripts that um, uh, assigned the um, this uh, attributed this text to Porphyry and the version in OCD because uh, there are not uh, big differences between these two versions. So when there are some some discrepancies, that I then I put the I uh, put some uh, footnotes to explain what the differences are. Okay. So what the text says is, when they mention diurnal stars, they refer to Zeus and Kronos by saying that these stars belong to the party of Helios, since they do not often set and do not make many figures. And they rejoice when they are operational during the day and in the domiciles of the diurnal stars. And when they mention the nocturnal stars, they speak about Ares and Aphrodite, since they classify them as belonging to the lunar party for the reasons for the reason they are of many figures and they often arrive in setting and become obscured but they call the star of hermes common since in whatever state he happens to be he assimilates to that state when he is a morning star he assimilates to helios but when he is an evening star to selene so this is the basic definition of what um contemporary astrologers are now referring to as the doctrine of sect um, and the distinction between daytime and nighttime charts and between the daytime team or party or sect of planets and the nighttime team or party of or sect of planets. So you're translating um, sect here as party, right? Yes, that's right. Well, um, the reason is very simple because this, um, this uh, word that is hieresis um, means uh, school of thought, or sect, or party, or religion, or something like that, that divides people. And um, I think in this context, it has a, a sort of a political message, because um, there is a governing party, and there is an opposition party all the time. So diurnal stars are in the governing party during the day, and nocturnal stars are in the opposition, and of course, uh, the situation just uh, changes after, after the sunset. So I just wanted to emphasize that in this case, it is not just about uh, sects, like uh, different camps of different toads, but it's also about the sort of, um, of, of a political tension between the two uh, parties of the stars. Okay, like a political party of, of who's in power versus who's out of power in some way? Exactly. 
Okay. Um, so, and then you have you contrast that with um, this version that is in the basics or the text that you're calling the basics, which has yes. a much shortened or abridged version of that, where it just says they call Helios, Kronos, and Zeus diurnal stars, while Selene, Ares, and Aphrodite nocturnal, and Hermes common, for he turns to the side of those with whom he is configured. Yes, configured. Yeah. yeah. Actually, uh, this basics is um, is an interesting text because um, um, I just mentioned this uh, on the celestial disposition that is um, a text uh, that originally consisted of uh, 135 chapters. Uh, this is a late compilation because some of the ch these chapters contain some versions of uh, Mashallah's um, uh, uh, little work on on um, interrogations which I will translate soon. So this is the only noun version of this, so the Arabic uh, version is not extant, or we don't know anything about the Latin version of this text. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so it's a, a, one part of this compilation is the is, um, is uh, parallel with this uh, Porphyry's um, ex excerpts from uh, Antiochus's uh, 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 introduction. But um, the first couple of first dozen um, chapters are some are con as they constitute a sort of um, an introduction to um, astrology in the form that is even more basic than the most basic Hellenistic uh, introductions are like Polus. Uh, so these are very simple uh, definitions, and in these uh, definitions, um, these uh, Porphyry's definitions are reused, recycled. And sometimes rephrased, and and I just wanted to to show. So with this document, I just wanted to show that uh, we have a full tradition of uh, of this uh, Porphyry's uh, excerpts. Uh, this is a branch uh, that has uh, many many connotations and many influences uh, everywhere. And I just wanted to show that um, we can't see the whole picture without uh, taking a look at these um, uh, variant versions. Yeah, that's going to be really important um, here when we look when we keep going through the passages in the different text we look at today. Just showing how sometimes comparing the other variant branches and interpretations and copies of the same passages sometimes gives you a better picture of perhaps what the original was, or at least gives you some insight into um, the doctrines that these authors were trying to pass down. Yeah, and we also need to to keep in mind that uh, while, um, of course, uh, for example, this basics is a late, is a late uh, compilation. Uh, actually, the age of the earliest manuscript of this uh, basics is uh, basically the same as the earliest surviving manuscript of the Porphyry's version. So we are not uh, uh, just uh, uh, looking at uh, some older or, or or more recent versions, but we also trying to to. Uh, to put together things that maybe can help us understand the other one, which is nominally older, but who knows what sort of changes uh, had been introduced during the course of the centuries. Sure. All right. Um, one of the last things, one of the things I like about this passage, and one of the things that's just important about Antiochus that I want to mention before we move on is it doesn't just define it uh, sort of like it does in the basics, but it also, you see embedded in it probably if not the original rationale, something close to or part of the original rationale for the doctrine of sect, where it both defines the concept, but also in passing it says that the diurnal stars are um, put on that team and they're grouped together because it says since they off they do not often set and do not make many figures, versus the nocturnal planets, it says that they are nocturnal because they. Um, they often arrive in setting and they become obscured. So Mars and Venus basically uh, set, as well as the Moon, set under the beams of the Sun frequently. And because they move more swiftly or more fast than the other planets, they make aspects more often. Whereas the other planets, the Sun and Saturn and Jupiter, are associated with the diurnal sect because they don't set under the beams as frequently. And they move more slowly, so they don't complete aspects with other planets as as frequently or as regularly. Yeah, uh, maybe um, there is one distinction here that um, the uh, text doesn't make it really clear. 
that um, uh, what sort of figures where we need to consider. But I guess that in this case, we need to look at the uh, the solar cycle, so the synodic cycle. So the uh, the figures uh, here refer to to the figures, to the configurations or aspects with the sun. Mm. Okay, so like um, figures in terms of like the stations, like stationing retrograde or stationing direct, and exactly. other parts but of the also, solar phase cycle. Also, the uh, the classical aspects um, may be um, may be assigned here. Mm -hmm. So okay, so that's a good recurring thing, and this is one of the reasons why this text has become so important over the past ten or twenty years with different astrologers, including Robert Schmidt, and then later with me and Demetra George and Benjamin Dykes, and why, especially for me and Demetra, large parts of our texts were talking about this text because it contains some of those original rationales as well as some very early definitions of Western astrology. And I think even in Ben Dykes's introductions to astrology, he did pulls some of the definitions from Antiochus as well when comparing them to later authors from Abu Mashar. Um, so that's one of the reasons I'm excited about this and why you're, you're making a great contribution by basically making these definitions and this translation publicly and freely available is now for the first time anybody can read through these earliest definitions of the Western astrological tradition and, and start to wrestle with them and come to terms with or form their own understanding of this text rather than just relying on, on somebody else's interpretation. Not just that. If, um, if, if uh, people feel that they, they have uh, some valuable insights regarding the text or they have uh, some feedback that I can, I can build into uh, into a sort of um, improvement, and I can I can touch the the text, that the translation, or the footnotes again, and I can come up with some some newer versions. So it is it is like a work in progress all the time. So we can't say that okay, this is the definite this is the definitive translation and the definitive commentary, and that's that. So it can all it can be uh, changed anytime. It can morph into anything. Yeah, and I really appreciate that because unfortunately, while early in in the process of like Project Hindsight in the 1990s, that they almost had a similar idea of doing preliminary translations and publishing those right away and releasing them to the astrological community and to their supporters who were financing the project. Later, it seemed like Schmidt wanted to only publish things once he had final definitive translations and he had completed his entire reconstruction. But as a result of that, um, because all of this is so hard, it's always going to be a work in progress to some extent, um, he wasn't able to finish what he started and I think only published one of the final translation books of his planned 30-volume series. So you're kind of taking a different approach by putting all of this out early once you've translating it and then getting feedback from the community? Not just that. It's also important to, to, to know that, um, as I mentioned before, uh, there are tens of thousands of pages, manuscript pages containing uh, astrological texts. So it can easily turn out that uh, it is, so even a lifetime is not enough to translate all of them. Mm. So um, if, if someone wants to, to wait until everything just uh, uh, Builds up and and comes together and you can, and you can see the whole picture together and and every single aspect of the whole um, historical development of something, uh, of of which a large part is, is is already lost, then of course it cannot be completed in a lifetime. Sure. Yeah, and that's the other part of your approach that is different here. Is you're not you're trying to just translate the text and translate the different versions of the text straight as they are, as what the language says relatively literally, and you're not doing anything in the way of trying to reconstruct any original doctrines or things like that. You're just sort of letting the text speak for itself. Well, I don't believe in these sort of um, uh, ideas, in this uh, grand theories about the, the original astrology that was uh, founded by someone, a big uh, personality and uh, every every later text is just a sort of a reflection of this original ideas. So if if we take uh, for example the history of sciences or history of philosophy as a as a contrast, we can see that uh, this just doesn't exist. So there is not a, even if we say okay there was a founder of uh, of a sort of Western astrology, uh, this founder didn't come from nowhere. Mm -hmm. 
Right. They were always influenced by some earlier tradition that came before them that maybe they acted as a new starting point. So let's say like Plato or something like that. But then Plato was himself influenced by like Socrates and the pre Socratics and everyone else. Yeah. And of course, um, even the pre Socratics were influenced by someone else. So we can, we can go back in, in history. Um, so it's, it's just impossible, I guess. Sure. Okay. So, um, so going back to the text, um, one of the other definitions that's um, attracted a lot of commentary and a lot of, I don't want to say controversy, but a lot of discussion over the past, um, I think, 10 years, especially since Schmidt published his translation of Antiochus and Porphyry in 2009, was the definition, the basic definition that Porphyry and Antiochus give of um, aspects, which they yes. call in your translation on bearing testimony. Yeah. Well, yes. Um, I don't think that we need to to um, to give um, um, a very big importance for the for the for the naming of this um, aspects in in uh, Hellenistic astrology. So actually, testimony means that uh, uh, um, the the stars or the planets are in, in some sort of a configuration. They can they can see each other, and that's how they can they can give testimony or they can witness to each other. That's so simple. So this is what they do in a configuration or in an aspect. Yeah. Um, What's the Greek term for aspect that you're translating as testimony here? Well, the um, the testimony, um, the the um, the word for testimony is marturia, actually, and there is another version of this, uh, epimarturia, that I, I translated uh, as uh, bearing testimony. Um, well. It, it uh, looks like um, the early texts of um, Hellenistic astrology were in in, um, in poetical form, so in verse form, and that's why they um, often used uh, some sort of synonyms uh, for the same very same concept. And we don't have to uh, to uh, to uh, give uh, too much weight to the different uh, words in this case. So even for example the um, what what uh, the, the the stars do in a configuration is often um, um, expressed with a with a visual verb like uh, see, behold, observe, scrutinize, or something like that. Of course, these are just uh, choices what the translator chooses to to express this uh, Greek verb and that Greek verb. But uh, it doesn't look like there is much difference between the word usage. Okay, but the word originally meant to to bear witness or to give testimony as if the planets are, are looking at each other and there was some sort of visual or optical ideas underlying that? Sure, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's of course, um, so it has these two sides. So if I bear witness to, to someone else, then of course this other, other star can be, well, it, it's, uh, he or she is acting in public and uh, there are some witnesses. And these witnesses are not just uh, witnesses of a crime, but witnesses of some sort of a celebration, like uh, like a marriage. And of course, uh, if uh, if there is a witness, that it it, it, it uh, he or she is also um, a part of the story and not isolated uh, from the other ones. That's why um, there is this um, this Hellenistic um, concept of uh, running in the void that can be imagined only with uh, only with a moon. Uh, and um, and this is a uh, this uh, when it, when it happens to a birth to a nativity, then it is it it is really harmful because it means that, that there is some some part of the personality that is unpredictable. Yeah, we'll get we'll, we'll do that definition later. I definitely want to get to running in the void. Okay. Um, so let's let's read this one definition. It's a little long, but it's worth it just to show how the author originally Antiochus. Um, defined the concept or attempted to outline the concept of aspects. So it says, they call the mutual configurations of the stars bearing testimony. These figures are the trigon, the figure with five signs, when there are three intermediate signs between the two affected signs, the tetragon, the figure within four signs, when there are two intermediate signs between them, the diameter, the figure within seven signs when there are five intermediate signs, and the hexagon, the figure within three signs when there is one intermediate sign between them. Uh, so the configuration by trigon is sympathetic and beneficial, and when a malefic is involved, he is less harmful. 
the tetragonal configuration is unpleasant and inharmonious and capable of causing distress when a malefic is involved. The diametrical configuration is adversative, but it is even more pernicious when a malefic is involved, and the hexagonal configuration is weaker. One must also see if the figures are perfect according to the degree and not only according to the sign. The trigon in 120 degrees, the tetragon in 90 degrees, the hexagon in 60 degrees, and the diameter in 180 degrees, for the stars are often configured by sign, but not by degree. Yes. So, yeah, so that's, that's it. So it's a, just a basic definition of, first it defines aspects by sign, and partially based on how many signs apart um, each of the, the planets would be, depending on what signs they're located in. Then it's, it talks about the quality or the nature of the aspects and whether it's more uh, positive or more challenging or negative. And then finally, it also says that aspects can be measured not just by sign, but also by degree. Um, and it says that um, they can be configured by sign, but no longer by degree. Yeah, I guess that it was this no longer was the, the original translation by Schmidt, who um, wanted to to develop into a um, into a very specialized idea um, that how these uh, uh, sign based and and uh, degree based uh, aspects or or testimonies are different from each other. But in this case, it is very simple. There is a bigger set that is a uh, uh, configuration by sign, and there is a smaller set that is configuration by degree. Actually, this very text doesn't tell anything about the importance of degree-based configurations, but I believe that um, um, and what follows here, the, the version of basics, uh, adds some, uh, some, some ideas about the importance of degree-based uh, uh, configurations. Okay, should we, do you want to read that part? Or oh, should we why go not? look at the basics? Okay, so just uh, I, I guess it is the, at the end of this uh, this longish uh, uh, chapter. So, so we just read the porphyry version and then the basics. What yes, part of and, it? Oh, I guess this is the end of this. So if you just uh, go down a little bit, because uh, it is very, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, oh, this one. Okay, right here. All right. Yes. Yeah. That's it. That's, so it, that's it. So this version in the basics, it says, one must also see if the figures are perfect according to the degree, and not only according to the sign, since the stars configured by degree are more powerful than those configured by sign only. That's the trigon, it. The tr okay, and then it just defines the aspects after that. So this was the other or the later interpretation or or a variant of this whole textual transit um, textual tradition. And the notion that perhaps, at least in this version of the basics, that the degree-based aspects were more powerful than just being configured by sign. Yes, that's it. So I guess that this this explains uh, the, the the main difference. Even if uh, this is a uh, uh, so we don't know it for for sure that um, it was um, just a late idea developed after the after writing the Porphyry's version, but it was somewhere before in the in the tradition. So that's why I just uh, find it important to to publish the uh, the variant versions to see the the whole picture how they how they uh, made them into some sort of concept. Yeah, in this this passage, this whole definition from Antiochus and Porphyry about the difference between sign based and degree based aspects, I think, was a recurring theme in Hellenistic astrology in general. And while we see it clearly defined here in the context of just aspects and aspects by sign and by degree both being relevant, I think there was probably a similar um, mindset that they applied to houses where uh, houses could be uh, defined both by sign as well as by degree um, and that you had to pay attention to both. And while this isn't explained as clearly in some of the earlier authors, it seems really clear that by later in the tradition, by the time of Firmicus and Rhetorius, that they're really clearly trying to pay attention to both um, like whole sign houses, which is houses by sign, as well as uh, quadrant houses or sometimes equal houses, which would be houses by degree. 
Yeah, it is quite possible. Uh, we need to bear in mind that um, the, 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 most of the surviving horoscopes are um, all used the sign of, of, of the stars, so the planets. So they don't have any degrees. And, uh, and uh, we, so we shouldn't forget about the fact that uh, they didn't really have uh, the sophisticated methods of, uh, of calculating uh, planetary longitudes uh, down to the degree. So maybe that was too laborious. Uh, so they were just happy with with sign based uh, aspects and sign based uh, um, um, house divisions to, to use this this expression. Mm. Yeah, but of course uh, they they had um, some ideas about uh, what could make it into more precise uh, um, um, a calculation form. Yeah, sure. So so part of your your point then is is that most of the time in terms of the surviving evidence, in terms of the surviving horoscopes, it seems like they're just calculating. Um, planetary placements by sign and using whole sign houses and probably whole sign aspects. But um, with texts like this, at least from relatively early on, there was at least an ideal that perhaps if you could calculate things by degree, that would be a useful additional piece of information to factor into the interpretation. Yeah. Um, so this is also important um, a subject to see the, what 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 is theory and what is practice because uh, there we can see some discrepancies between theory and practice. So theory is always more sophisticated, far more sophisticated than um, actual real life practice seems to be, um, because uh, so there are, th there is this plethora of uh, of uh, of different techniques um, um, in theoretical texts, but what we see in actual um, Case book horoscopes, well, there are not so many different techniques uh, being used. But um, I guess that that's why we need to discover both the theoretical side and the, the practical side, because maybe it, the, the reason why they didn't use some things in practice was simply that they didn't have the time for these calculations, for example. But there was an idea that they would like to, to reach that level. Sure. Yeah. Um, all right, that makes sense, and that's a whole thing we could get into, but we'll save that more for another discussion or another episode. Yeah. Um, and I and I did some of that in my episode on the origins of the house division debate last year, so I can link to that uh, at some point as well. So the other, um, let's see, other definitions. Once once they outlined the basic um, aspect definition, one of the other definitions I wanted to look at. Uh, where I liked your translation was on what you translate as the concept of domination. Um, and I liked that you used that as a translation convention. And that is another point is just you're having to establish translation conventions here for your translations. And in some instances, you're retaining and you're using translation conventions that had been used or, or introduced by others. And in other instances, you're um, going against that, or you're you're coming up with your own translation conventions in order to more correctly convey the sense of the text. Yeah, but um, well, that that can be always debated. So um, so tr translation conventions are 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 questions that can never that can never be settled. Uh, uh, for, to the to the uh, contentment of every everybody. So a lot of people say that uh, they are disturbed by by um, by words like uh, Helios or Salini or the translation, the literal translations of the of the names of the signs or um, the names of the aspects. For example, they would prefer to see the the, the well known modern uh, uh, terms, but. Uh, this is one thing, and the other thing is that uh, there can be a lot of synonyms that a translator can use. In uh, so uh, I, I am always open to any sort of suggestions. So I can I can I can alter the, the translations if there is something that uh, someone can convince me to to change uh, this this term into something else. But uh, uh, I try to to um, to follow the footsteps of the previous uh, translators, uh, tran uh, translators of um, uh, Hellenistic texts, but sometimes I, I I felt I needed to 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 change the term because I thought that uh, they didn't convey the, the the right meaning in this case. So, for example, this uh, domination. Well, mm -hmm. actually, the the original uh, Greek uh, uh, term for this is uh, epidekateia, which has something to do with with uh, being. Um, um, in the tenth, yeah. Well, 
on ten thing. <laughs> right. Like, what like sort of yes. up, upon the tenth, because epi just means like upon and deca yeah. means means ten or ten. Ten. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's it. So it's a it's a it's something that can't be um expressed in English in a in a in a natural way. So it, it's always weird. And uh and Schmidt uh, wanted to to um to use the expression decimation. Mm-hmm. But uh, decimation uh, in English and in other languages, and uh, um, also in Latin, means uh, something very different. So it means like uh, a sort of punishment that every every tenth uh, soldier is uh, is, is, ki- is ki- killed after uh, a lost battle, or to, yeah, to teach it discipline. Is. And it has very it, ne- negative or like extreme connotations. Yeah, extreme connotations that are not used in this in this case. So this um, this in this case this is just um, this is just being in the tenth sign in the, from 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 the from uh, a star yeah it and is then, it is a special a very, case of uh, overcoming actually right and then the planet that's in the tenth sign relative to another planet having a special uh, influence or being able to exert a very powerful influence over another planet. So that's why I I argued for domination as the translation of this and later saw that Holden had translated it that way as well. So I was happy to see you using that here. Um but let's here let's read the definition really quickly and then we can keep discussing it. So in the Porphyry version it says the star being in the 10th sign is said to dominate and overcome the star being in the 4th sign. For example, the star that happens to be in the balance dominates the star being in the goat horned one, and the star being in the goat horned one also dominates the star being in the ram. So, in other words, in the example, it's saying that a, a planet in Libra is is dominating or or is in the tenth relative to a planet in Capricorn, versus um, a planet in Capricorn is in the tenth or is dominating a planet that is in Aries. Because it's in the tenth sign relative to it. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So this is tied into the the notion of overcoming, which is actually the next definition um, after this. But it's just a sign based aspect of a planet that is ten signs for another planet, and if it's a malefic planet that's in that position, then it's usually interpreted as being a, a very negative condition. Whereas if it's a benefic that's in the tenth sign relative to another planet, it's usually interpreted as being a very positive condition in authors like Vadius Valens, for example, where he uses this sometimes or versions of this in his chart examples. And just that, I guess this this um, um, overcoming and um, and domination is a very early concept because um, uh, there are some texts. Um, uh, attributed to to Dorotheus and and Anubio, for example, and um, and Firmicus Maternus also um, uh, has uh, these descriptions uh, about uh, planetary configurations. And in the in the section about the Tetragon, uh, there are um, detailed descriptions. Uh, what happens if uh, if uh, planet A um, is uh, dominating, and what happens if planet B is dominating? So. Um, having um, a, um, a square aspect uh, between, let's say, uh, Mercury and Mars is not the same if uh, they change place. And um, uh, and if and if uh, we look at these uh, these definitions, we can see that there was a common ancestor of these definitions, and this common ancestor um, um, could well have been um, Nekhepsi and Petosiris. Yeah, and that's that's actually the the namesake of your translation project is it's the the Horai project uh, because that was the name actually of a, a famous lost book of definitions that was attributed to Petasiris, right? Yes, it sounded like a good uh, name for this project. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so maybe some of these early definitions go back to one of those early authors, and then. Um, later authors drew on them and incorporated them into their work. Um, all right, so that 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 definition is connected to and comes right before. Uh, although sometimes I almost think that that definition of domination should have come after the definition of overcoming. But immediately after that, here in Porphyry, we have the definition of overcoming, and it says every star that is situated in the right hand trigon, tetragon, or hexagon overcomes the one on the left since he is moving toward the other one 
For example, a star being in the goat horned one, which is Capricorn, overcomes the one being in the bull in a trigonal, and the one being in the ram in the tetragonal, and the one being in the fishes in a hexagonal figure, while he is overcome basically himself by the one being in the balance, the one being in the virgin, and the one being in the scorpion. So it's saying that overcoming can occur um, by a triangle, which is a trine, a square, or a sextile by any planet that is earlier in zodiacal order. It overcomes any planet that is later in zodiacal order. And then it goes on to say, they say overcoming is more powerful if the stars are either trigonal or tetragonal, for the star overcoming in this way is stronger, and if he is rising or even pivotal, then if he is a benefic, he indicates an outstanding birth, but if a malefic, he indicates an insignificant one. And then there's a little stray sentence that repeats the earlier statement. It says, in general, every star that is on the right overcomes the one on the left whom he approaches. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess that um, this um, sentence is uh, three, four, and five uh, uh, belong to a, a, a part of this uh, text that I had to um, to revise um, and uh, and uh, restore. Uh, from the uh, different manuscripts, because uh, there were just uh, different versions um, expressing the the same core idea in different ways, and it was not what wasn't a um, hundred percent clear what the uh, uh, critical edition wanted to express. So I needed to look at the different versions, and I guess that um, um, I was sort of successful with uh, reconstructing the original meaning of the passage. I put my reconstruction in the footnotes, and uh, there are the indications of the readings of the other manuscripts as well. Right. So, so down in the footnotes, you give the different you you give the different variant readings, and you say like which manuscript says this versus this other manuscript tradition says changes the sentence to be more like this and. That's how you have this sort of running commentary about the text that you're drawing on. Yeah, maybe this this commentary is not really interesting for for um, for the reader who just wants to 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 understand the text. But otherwise, it is um, important to see because um, so this is this is not a, a, a there is no authority that can claim. Okay, I know everything about Hellenistic astrology. I will tell what this passage means. So there can be always debated issues like uh, what, whether this reading is correct or whether that reading is correct, and there are some differences uh, just by uh, using a different interpunction. Sometimes you know they they have uh, uh, very old interpunctions in in the manuscripts, and uh, and you know it just, just um, uh, changes the meaning. So I just want to want to give the readers. Um, uh, provided they are interested in in these sort of uh, questions, uh, to to give them the, the 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 opportunity to decide whether they would like to 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 follow my footsteps or they have a different uh, opinion and they think that okay this should be interpreted in another way. Yeah, because sometimes that actually makes a real difference. How you read a passage or whether you go with one variant reading or another can have very concrete practical interpretive differences in terms of if astrologers are trying to draw on these texts and use them to practice astrology, they might use the technique one way if they read one version versus they might use the technique a different way if they read another version. And we'll actually get to a really striking instance of that when we get to the definition of corruption or maltreatment here in just a few definitions. Yeah, I guess this is the best uh, example for that. <laughs> yeah. So before we get there, I wanted to read the um, definition of Void of course, so which in Greek it was originally called running in the void, and this is number seventeen in the text, and it says it is called running in the void when Selene is applying to no one either by sign or by degree, either by figure or adherence, and she is not about to make an application or conjunction within the next thirty degrees. Such births are unpredictable and unable to develop. So this is the the ancient and probably oldest ancestor or version of the modern concept of the void of course moon, except what's always been striking to people over the course of the past 10 or 20 years since 
some versions of this definition were first translated from Hellenistic authors is that it defines it as being the moon not completing an exact aspect, either a conjunction or any of the other aspects within the next 30 degrees, which is actually um, a somewhat rare uh, occurrence, although it does happen from time to time. Yeah, but I guess that uh, this shouldn't surprise people so much because uh, we are talking about natal um, context in this case. And of course, uh, this is a very, very negative indication for a native to, to have a, a, a moon uh, running in the void. So it means that uh, somehow, you know, the, the postman the, or the postwoman <laughs> or the postperson of this, uh, uh, of this uh, planetary influence is just um, um, a it's just isolated from the rest of the the party so they so the moon is supposed to 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 bring uh, uh forth the 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 influences of the of the planets and and uh, if if the if the moon is just uh, confined to a place where nobody can uh, bear witness to her and this is something that uh, the part of the part of the of the soul or part of the the spirit or part of the fate is, is separated from the rest of it. So it is not a, not a whole building, but uh, there is a separate part that uh, that is um, moving on its own. Okay. So in the original Greek term is uh, kenodromia, which means like running in the void or, or moving in the emptiness or something like that, right? Yeah, or or void, of course. So of course, it is it is about course or running. And uh, there is this uh, this cano uh, prefix, which means uh, void, empty. So it is moving in the emptiness, running in the emptiness. Yeah. So that's really important then, because then it means that when sometimes you go back and read ancient interpretations of what void, of course, mean, like from Firmicus Maternus, um, that are very negative. This is not something that is happening like every other day, according to this this Hellenistic version of the definition. But instead, it's something that happens somewhat infrequently when the moon doesn't um, complete any aspect within basically a forty eight hour or two day period. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, well, if if someone just um, uh, tries to develop another version and a more uh, comprehensible version of this definition, then uh, they will find that uh, it can be defined in in the way that, for example, the first and the moon uh, need to be needs to be in a sign that is averted to to every other planet. So this is the first um, uh, condition, and the other condition is that the the moon has to be um, has to have the uh, the the fewest degrees possible in the sign. So, uh, and it wasn't um, uh, observed by me, but uh, but I re- uh, but I, a reader of mine actually that uh, why the uh, the medieval um, definition of void of course uh, um, uh, emphasizes being at the end of the sign. In this case, uh, being at the beginning of the sign is emphasized because the moon. Uh, when the moon enters a new sign that is averted to every other planet, then at the first moment she becomes running in the void, and this this just continues until uh, she reaches the same degree uh, as any other planet have uh, has uh, in a, in, a, in another sign. Mm. Yeah, yeah. One of the um, back in two thousand ten when. Uh, Dimitra George. So actually, it's like ten years ago this summer. Uh, Dimitra George and Benjamin Dykes and I got together for a week, and Dimitra had translated a bunch of these definitions, and we were going to look at them ourselves and see how they compared to Schmidt's translations and interpretations, and try to come to our own c- conclusions about them. And that was a really important um, turning point for the three of us. One of the interpretations or the observations that Ben made that I always liked was that. The def- this definition of void, of course, is almost as if you were doing a set of um, equal houses from the degree of the moon, and then all of the having all of the planets being in one of the places in aversion to the moon, according to those that equal house system, in a way, and, and as a way of thinking about it, which would be like the second or the sixth or the eighth or the twelfth. Well, yes, this is the same. Uh, just um, it's a it's a different uh, approach. Yes, but uh, I just want to to remind um, uh, 
lovers of um, of Arabic and medieval astrology that there is a, a very similar um, a concept in this uh, later astrology, which is the ethereal moon or the ethereal planet that is not just uh, running in the void or having a, a void of course, but uh, having a void of course in a ethereal way, which means that uh, he or she, so mostly the moon of course, uh, is uh, um, in aversion from the beginning to the end of the sign, which is very sim very similar to this um, uh, Hellenistic concept. And of course, it also indicates the same, basically, that there is one part of the, uh, of the, of the fate and of the character that is unpredictable, uh, can't uh, develop, and so it can't be addressed and dealt with. Okay, brilliant. Um, all right, so let's move on to some other definitions. The next one I want to look at really quickly is the definition of uh, what you call neutralization, uh, which I, I've called or others have called counteraction. So it says, it is called neutralization when the diurnal stars occupy the domiciles or the exaltations of the nocturnal stars, or when the nocturnal stars do so with those of the diurnal stars. And then there's like a semicolon and it says, or, and it gives an alternative version or definition of neutralization. And it says, or when although the stars lying on the signs are productive of good, the masters of the signs being unproductive are in corruption. And there's a, there's a lot packed into there. So there's like two different definitions. And then the second one is a little, little complicated by, because it's taking for granted some other concepts. Um, yeah. So, what was the term underlying this, or what was the Greek term? Well, it is antanalusis, and um, it, it means that um, that um, mm, resolving something in the opposite way. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, w w well, of course, a counteraction could be also a nice a translation. Just I couldn't imagine that uh, counteraction can this this can be used as a verb. So, counteract. So it's like um, hmm. so it, it 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 just sounded too 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 weird for me. So after a while, after uh, experimenting with uh, this counter uh, action, I just uh, settled with uh, with the neutralization because um, this is some this is actually what uh, what uh, um, a most a master does with the with the with the root uh, planet. So the root planet has um has an agenda, and the um. Just that uh, there is an there is an override by the part of the of the of the of the domicile master, so that's right. it, basically. So in the second ver second part of the definition or the second version of it, it's talking about basically and generally speaking, a planet that is well placed, especially let's say by by sign and by house, but then it's ruled by another planet. It's in the the sign ruled by another planet, and the ruler of that sign is poorly placed in. A, a bad house, and therefore it drags down the first planet because the ruler of that sign is in bad condition. By, it, for example, being it says unproductive, so that's I'm guess, that's achrematisticos, I think, right? Yes, yeah, that's right. So achrematisticos, yeah. the places uh, that are achrematisticos are places like the sixth house or the twelfth house. So it's basically defining a situation where a planet is ruled by a planet that is placed in one of the difficult houses. Yes, that's right. Well, yeah. Um, well, it, it, of course, it, it depends on the context how we can interpret this these sort of conditions. And also, you see that uh, there is um, an, another part of this uh, definition that just uh, says that um, if, uh, if finally um, the the business of a, of a, of a, of a star is managed by by um, by a, another star that is uh, that has um, opposite interests because uh, they belong to different parties. Then, of course, there is some sort of counteraction or neutralization of the agenda. It right. is just diverted somehow. It's like hijacking. Mm -hmm. If it's ruled by a planet that's of the opposite sect, sure. Right. Okay. Um, so that leads us into the very next definition that comes after that, which is the definition of what you're calling corruption, um, and is sometimes in other texts. In my book, I called it maltreatment. I think following Schmidt, um, 
Well, is- yeah, this is the this is the lexicon definition of it. So, um, of course, everybody uh, works with the uh, lexicons, and uh, the most uh, uh, popular lexicon to to use for the Greek language is the Little Scott Jones uh, lexicon. But um, this lexicon was actually uh, developed for the Attic Greek, uh, the Attic uh, prosaic writers of the fourth uh, century BCE. And of course, it was later augmented to, to incorporate some, some of the texts, uh, some of the words from the later uh, period of uh, Greek language. But Greek language actually has um, a, a history of more than 2000 years. It, if we just uh, take uh, the so-called pre-modern Greek into consideration. If we take uh, modern Greek into consideration, then we can easily talk about uh, almost uh, uh, three, uh, so 3,000 years. So 2,000 and 3,000 years, of course, I'm, I'm talking about. So, of course, it's impossible to, to build up such big uh, uh, dictionaries. And there are some other dictionaries dealing with different periods, like... Um, uh, uh, with, uh, dictionaries for the New Testament or uh, patristic lexicons or, or Byzantine lexicons of the different ages. And sometimes uh, uh, translators need to, uh, to work together with these lexicons and not just to rely on Lydia Scott Jones, which is um, a, a, a kind of outdated lexicon from, from some perspectives. And sometimes it also happens that there are some words that are not in the lexicons at all. So I just um, um, bumped into a, um, a word that uh, is, um, so it, it can be easily interpreted because uh, it is just a, um, a, a derivation of form from, a, from an adjective. But actually, this is just not found in the lexicons. And maybe this was the reason why in some manuscripts it was also altered to express something uh, totally alien from the context, actually. Um, yeah, and um, and and maltreatment. So maltreatment is the is the uh, the lexicon um, uh, definition of this uh, the uh, Lydia Scott Jones uh, uh, definition of this uh, uh, term kakosis, mm-hmm. which is uh, coming from the from the verb kako, which means uh, to maltreat, to to harm, to ill treat, and something like that. To, but to ab- keko, ab- abuse or something abuse, like that. Abuse, yes, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, but kakos is is um is a, is an abstract uh, noun, and and um, um, kakosis can also happen by by just uh, being being at the at the at the bad place at the at the bad timing. You know, so yeah, it's like it's, I'm not maltreated by, by anyone. I'm just maltreated by being somewhere that I am not supposed to be at. Mm. So, and right. this happens to, to, to the planets, because if we just go through the definition, we will see that, that in some cases, kakosis happens by um, malefics, but sometimes it's just uh, by bad location. Right. So part, part of your reason why you wanted to go with corruption That's here right. as, as the definition is that sometimes while it's true that it is a condition where a malefic is doing something to another planet so that you could say that it's like maltreating it, and that would be a good term. Sometimes in the definition we're about to read, it's just a planet being poorly positioned in and of itself, and it's not necessarily being harmed due to another planet per se, but it's just a condition that the planet has, and that's why you felt like corruption might be a better term to use. Yes, yeah, maybe. Um, of course, the people can sense the difference between uh, um, planet A maltreating or abusing planet B, or planet A corrupting uh, planet B. Mm. But uh, if we if we just uh, remember that um, in the in the Greek form, so both these ideas are incorporated, then just we can't uh, make a mistake. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a good thing to keep in mind. So let's let's read the definition. So it says, "It is called corruption when a star is the target of rays cast by the malefics, or he is enclosed by them." or he is in the application or adherence of a malefic, or he is in diameter with a malefic, or he is overcome, or domicile mastered by a badly situated malefic while he is in decline in the unproductive places. For if he is in the productive places, he is ameliorated by place by the place, and the corruption of the corrupted star is removed. 
So that that last little bit is like a new sentence, and in previous translations by like Demetra and by Schmidt was not included. So where did that last part of the sentence come from? Well, as I said, that uh, there are uh, two um, bunches of um, manuscripts for the uh, Porphyry's version, and uh, one of uh, these. Uh, um, so one group doesn't contain this uh, sentence, but there is this other group that is found in the. Uh, so these are the manuscripts of the on the uh, celestial disposition. So they have this. Uh, so, so you say in your footnotes that manuscripts A, D, M, S, and V, or what you what you're calling that, um, end at the point where it just stipulates the negative condition. Yeah, but these then are the porphyry manuscripts actually. Yes, and uh, there are some other manuscripts that uh, still have this um, this uh, finishing um, sentence. Okay. Um, got it. So, part of the issue with this definition, it's it's really important. Um, it's tying together and it's taking for granted a bunch of other concepts that were already defined previously, like um, having a ray cast by a malefic and what that means, or being enclosed by two malefics, which is when a planet is is sort of sandwiched in between two malefic planets, either exactly. by conjunction or by their rays. Um, it's also talking about application or adherence, which is when a planet is applying to another planet within three degrees of an exact degree-based aspect, right? Yes, and then bodily also, because adherence um, here refers to to bodily um, uh, conjunction. Right. So that's something that's going to throw off some modern readers when they first read this text. Is it is they're separating the conjunction and they're treating the conjunction as a class unto itself, and then they're treating the other aspects of the sextile, square, trine, and opposition as being in their own category that's different from a from a conjunction. Yeah, but uh, there are different uh, expressions uh, used by different um, authors, and I guess that that's why it would be a um, very important task and a very important project to. Uh, to give not just a commentary to this uh, porphyry text, uh, possibly uh, not just porphyry text, but a porf uh, possibly uh, to get uh, so a translation that incorporates also some other witnesses of the same um, uh, core ideas of uh, Antiochus. So what I want to say is that uh, that would be, uh, so it would be important to have a commentary that uh, that gives. Uh, um, so just explains what is written in the text as the way I'm just doing now, what we are just doing now, but also um, uh, highlights how these uh, concepts were used by different uh, authors, by other authors, uh, not belonging to the tradition of uh, Antiochus, for example. I just want to mention something, and I don't think that we need to to go into the details, that, that there is this, um, um, this um, um, argued um, concept of uh, of casting rays or hurling rays or throwing rays at somebody, mm. or or yeah, being thrown by rays, yeah. Um, and and the definition here um, in the in this Porphyry text and then the in in the and in, in the text deriving from here say that uh, it is the. Uh, the star on the left that uh, that uh, uh, casts a ray uh, on a planet on the right. So it is basically the uh, the the uh, the antithesis of uh, of the overcoming. So right, yeah. On the right, I'm I'm just overcoming you, and uh, yeah, don't overcome me because I will cast a ray on you. Um, something like that, but it seems that in the in the um, so the original idea of of, uh, of uh, casting a ray was from the right, but uh, that was just a reconceptualization by Antiochus and everybody following him uh, to to say that uh, it is the planet on the left that uh, that casts a ray. So that's why this should be a, a fully explained using the already available sources. And of course, this commentary could be augmented or updated, upgraded as uh, new witnesses of, of relevant texts um, um, just um, uh, uh, are, are discovered. Yeah, I mean, that's partially a large part of what I tried to do in my book, especially in the House Division, or not the House Division, the Aspects chapter where I took Demetra's translation of some of these definitions and then broke them down and commented on 
what they seem to mean and how they were used differently in some authors. And I spent a good deal of time talking about uh, hurling rays or casting a ray and some of the issues with that, where it's used in two different ways depending on what author is using it. Yeah. Um, all right. So that's on corruption, and that's uh, an important definition. There's one other one that might be relevant to to mention really quickly, which is just the um, very long section on the domicile master of the nativity, as well as the lord of the nativity and the predominator. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let, let's uh, pa pause really quickly for a sec. Oh yeah, okay. Um, just before we just go into that, I guess that this is a, this is a chapter that uh, um, just um, uh, uh, sparked uh, uh, a lot of people's imagination about uh, about the importance of these different uh, uh, of uh, these different uh, dominators of of the of the nativity. But actually, it seems that this sort of uh, conceptualization um, is only known from from the tradition of uh, Antiochus. So this sort of uh, of partitioning, like there is the lord of the nativity, that there is the domicile master, and there is this predominator. So these three bosses of the nativity. So th this is uh, something special to Antiochus and his tradition. Uh, special in in what sense? I mean, it seemed like the idea of like the overall ruler of the chart was something that was discussed in different authors. And sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, uh, uh, the domicile master that is the oikodespotes and the and the predominator that is the epicrateter is um, is that um, um, in in many um, handbooks, of course. But uh, the third one, this that uh, this lord of nativity. So this is always uh, something that is. Oh yeah, is it a separate one or is it uh, just a function of the uh, domicile master? Just to take an example, so this is a this is a debated issue. Yeah, um, so I talked about that in in episode two hundred five of the astrology podcast titled "The Master of the Nativity: Finding the Ruler of the Chart," but um, I didn't really read a definition of it at the time, and this is the actual text that I was drawing on primarily in addition to consulting with some other text, but it's the clearest, one of the clearest definitions of this concept in the ancient tradition. So um, I don't want to read the entire thing because it's actually a somewhat long um, yeah. thing, but it's basically the earliest set of definitions or one of the earliest set of definitions for how to find or at least to attempt to find something like the overall ruler of the chart. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's move on. So those are basically those are some of the definitions from Antiochus or from Porphyry, and people can read that full document um, now. And I'll put a link to it um, in the description for this episode. There's a few other texts I wanted to look at just really briefly, though, for the rest of this episode before we wrap up, just to give people an idea or give people a taste for some of the other texts that you're translating, which are really interesting and really important. So one of the other ones is Rhetorius on the systematic interpretation of nativities. And this is um, another one of the texts that you've released where this is pretty much a complete translation um, of an early summary that Rhetorius must have made or somebody around that time, around the 5th or 6th or 7th century about how electional astrology was done and what you're supposed to pay attention to uh, in the Hellenistic astrological tradition. Yeah, but I guess that when we talk about this um, systematic interpretation of uh, inceptions, so this is the nativities, but there is another text that is very similar, but it is about inceptions. Of oh yeah, course, sorry, I'm like confusing the two texts that we're about to talk about. So we're we're going to talk about the one that's about how to interpret a natal chart, and it's unique for that for that reason because this is Rhetorius on the systematic interpretation of nativities, and it's about. Um, most of the Hellenistic authors, we have like handbooks where they talk about individual topics and how to interpret charts in the context of those topics, like children or marriage or travel or what have you. But there's not really any texts except for this one that summarize and tell you how to put everything together to do like a full consultation. That's right. That's right. And uh, there is, uh, and there are some interesting features of this text, anyways. <laughs> Okay. Um, what are some of the interesting features? Well, uh, first thing is that um, um, so if I use the the 
the common terms delineation and prediction that people normally think that the first thing is to uh, to delineate the text and then to go to predictions. Mm. But it seems that after an initial evaluation of the planets, um, the uh, the author just wants us to to move uh, immediately toward uh, um, predictions, and then um, at the end we go back to delineations, which is uh, really surprising, I guess. Sure. So, so you have um, the name Rhetorius in quotes here. So, you think that this text, even though it's sometimes attributed to it, Rhetorius, or there's a version of it that Rhetorius may have authored, you think it was actually written by another author? Yeah, actually, I believe that uh, this text, the original version, was uh, was authored by the uh, anonymous <laughs> astrologer of Zeno. So people would think that I, I attribute everything to this <laughs> obscure person. But actually, I guess that this this uh, imperial astrologer was uh, responsible for composing the uh, original version of this text, which is, uh, I believe, which is the version one here. Uh, this is the first um, uh, translation and the first um, so it hasn't been edited any anywhere. So I, I just worked from uh, manuscripts directly to to translate them, which is nice because I needed to 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 do the the same uh, job as uh, editors do, you know, ch just to compare the different readings and to decide which uh, reading should uh, constitute the uh, the genuine one. So I guess that this was uh, uh, written by uh, in the fifth century by this um, imperial astrologer, and then later some other Byzantine astrologers just uh, developed it uh, further. So there are three versions here appended and uh, edited together. Okay, uh, and these are the so this is everything that we have about this text actually. Okay, so you you translate three different versions of it in this PDF that you've released, and uh, uh, one some... one other thing I just want to uh, want to highlight is that uh, um, uh, Robert Schmidt already uh, translated um, the uh, the third version and uh, also um, uh, translated some portions of the second version. So mm. the other versions have already been translated in uh, to English, but uh, this is a, um, a synoptic edition. Here, the retranslation. Sure. So this is the first time that the first version has been translated, and it's the first yes. time that all three have been compared, uh, yes. translated in a in a parallel version. Yes. So you've got th the three different versions of the text here um, in three different paragraph paragraphs, three columns, basically that you can read side by side, and it's really interesting reading the different versions because. Um, you can see the differences, and this gives a really stark example where sometimes, like version one, will keep going. For example, talking about like what Ptolemy says to do, but then version two and version three will break break off and won't contain that section. Or later, um, there's other sections where version two or version three will keep going and talking about something, but then version one will not contain that section. So it's kind of a really good example sometimes of like textual comparisons and some of the frustrations with attempting to reconstruct or the idea of reconstructing an original text, because sometimes if one were to attempt to do that, you'd have to make kind of a judgment call about what was in the original versus what what wasn't, and you may or may not be right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it can be all, um, always frustrating because uh, sometimes um, mm, yeah, we have uh, really different tastes uh, than um, uh, medieval readers had. So the, there are hundreds of uh, different uh, versions of um, of uh, inceptions about um, I don't know political questions, for example. And you see that this is the first, this is the only uh, surviving uh, systematic. Um, um, uh, treatment of how to how to analyze uh, nativities and 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 even so um, a scribe that had you know the original version one at hand just um, gave up uh, after after a table or just somehow you know the the rest of the manuscript was just lost and was, and then that's why he was uh, um, unable to to copy them but sometimes it just happens that there is a there is a there is a chapter, and the 
and the um, they describe just uh, writes down. Okay, um, okay, look at this uh, this chapter in in another book. Blah blah, and you will never find this other book. Or there are some other scribes that uh, leave some pages or some paragraphs uh, blank um, in case they find the the, um, the the manuscript they need later. But of course, they they would never uh, uh, find it. So that's why we we don't have this these texts. Okay. Um, one of the things that's interesting about this text to me is that um, the authors, or some of the versions, will will mention in passing some of the earlier authors that they're drawing on, so that it's clear that they're kind of synthesizing the texts of earlier authors like Vedius Valens and Claudius Ptolemy and Dorotheus. Um, and so it's an it's an attempt to bring together into a systematic approach some of those the the techniques that those different earlier authors outlined. Yeah, well, I guess that this this was um, um sort of a personal uh, preference for this author to to choose um, Valens and and um, and Dorotheus and and Ptolemy for these uh, reasons. Um, and of course, this is not so. This is partly the reason why uh, why these are the the really popular and now and well known authors even now, because the ones who were just neglected and and not um, not um, revered by any any later authors, so just uh, got forgotten. Yeah, there's a lot of astrological texts that didn't survive, and then there's certain authors that were that became popular for different reasons and so their texts got propagated and and copied over again and sometimes referenced and maybe those references caused other later authors to seek them out and to try to preserve their texts or different parts of them whereas other other authors got overlooked for whatever reason yeah and there is sometimes it is just a question of chance so for example there is this um, um astrological author Julianus of uh, Laodicea whose um uh, two pieces uh, two chapters uh, translated uh, recently and who must have been a really notable and remarkable and 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 uh, um wise uh, author but unfortunately we've got a dozen of uh, fragments and that's all sure so just pieces of it or even Dorotheus, who's got to be one of the most influential astrological authors in history, we don't actually have the full original Greek text of Dorotheus. The primary treatment of Dorotheus we have is like a, a Arabic translation of a Persian translation of the original Greek text, uh, as well as a bunch of different Greek fragments and quotations and paraphrases from later authors. Yeah, but I think that um, um, so even even if um, if uh, we don't have the complete Dorotheus, um, it must ha- be like um, ninety ninety five percent that we do have. Right. So yeah, that's of true. course uh, the poetic form is lost, but maybe this is easier to to understand now and easier to translate now. Sure. Um, yeah. So let's let, let me read just a few quick excerpts from this text. Um, so let's re- I'll read from version one. So at the beginning it says, after you have ascertained the positions of the stars to the degree, the natures of their signs, their bounds according to the Egyptians, their trigons, participations, exaltations and depressions, their decans and the faces of these decans, their individual degrees and bright degrees, their twelfth parts, their latitudes in reference to the winds and the steps, their obliquities, that is their distances from the ecliptic just as from the meridian, their appearances, additions, or subtractions, or stationing, and according to the degree, the co-risings of the fixed stars that are close to them with reference to their magnitude, winds, and temperaments, then come to the hour marker and the midheaven, and the pivots, succedents, and declines to the degree. And when you, when you have already ascertained the seven stars in respect to their places, cast the seven lots that are subjoined in the introduction of the book, and ascertain the appearances of Selene, that is to say the conjunction or whole moon before birth, her third, seventh, and fortieth days, and her applications and separations by longitude and latitude. So it just it outlines like a string of like all of the basic stuff that you're supposed to calculate and know. And it's interesting that this author, going back to our earlier conversation, 
this is probably coming from the later part of the Hellenistic tradition, like the fifth or sixth century. And there is a emphasis where they're at least trying to emphasize, try to calculate things if you can to the degree if possible. Yes, definitely. Um, I guess that this this is why um, here to this uh, to the degree is always emphasized. Otherwise, um, I don't think it would make sense in the context of early Hellenistic texts. Yeah, well, it's it's a it's definitely a development by the time of Rhetorius and to a lesser extent even Firmicus. There's more of a, there, there's clearly a trend where they're moving more towards trying to calculate things to the degree and that being like an ideal to aspire to. Whereas certainly earlier in the tradition, it seems like the sign based approach was more common, and that's one of the things that's caused issues in terms of understanding what the actual practice was. Is sometimes the disconnect, like you were saying early, between the theory versus the the practice. Yeah, but um, even if we just put a, put aside this this the degree based considerations, still I wondered how many um, traditional astrologers uh, make such a detailed uh, uh, investigation of uh, of uh, planetary conditions. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, okay, so back to the text. Then it says, then after setting the general fixity of the birth and the pivots, succedence and declines to the degree, examine the domicile master of the birth according to the affor- aforementioned methods. Then, after considering and calculating the conception, cast the leading and following trigonal, tetragonal, and hexagonal sides of every star to the degree, note them down separately, and keep them at hand in order that when, during the interpretation of the circumambulations of the stars, we are making the adherences, we should not only take the trigonal, tetragonal, and hexagonal sides according to the sign, but also to the degree. For they are more cogent, and we, we had a t- discussion earlier about like the translation of cogent, um, especially in the signs of short and long ascension. Um, mm-hmm. After noting down all these said sides, examine the lifetime from the domicile master of the selected releaser. But when you are making the circumambulations of all the stars, do not forget that the adherences of the stars, the hour marker, the midheaven. And the lots that occur with the fixed stars have enormous performance in accordance with their temperaments, especially if both of them have the same wind. Um, and then he goes on and like quotes a long passage from Ptolemy about yes. um, the, what the fixed stars. Well, yes, it's a, it's about the, um, the the nature of the fixed stars uh, as related to to the planets. Well, actually, you will, you see that here in this in this paragraph, um, the the um, the instructions say that uh, you need to to um, to have a sort of um, prediction uh, uh, calculation first before uh, before diving into the details uh, about the, the the topics of the native. So I guess that this is a really reasonable because um, at, on one hand, this is a sort of a longevity. Um, 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 consideration, and also on the other hand, it's also um, you know uh, predicting uh, periods uh, or uh, in ret- retrospection, uh, looking at the different periods of a native uh, uh, can work without uh, assessing the topics uh, in delineation. Um, on one hand, and on the other hand. Um, they can also be used um, as sort of uh, correcting the, the 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 time of birth, right? So it's talking about doing circumambulations, which is primary directions here. Yes, and it's doing them from different, especially important places such as the ascendant, the midheaven, the lot of fortune, the sun and moon. Uh, and then actually, it says the remaining five stars. So it says just do your circumambulations from everything, but then it gives specific topics. For if you start from the ascendant, it says that the resulting primary directions periods will give indications for the reckoning about life and physical ailments. And you should do primary directions or circumambulations from the midheaven, which will indicate things relative to activity, reputation, livelihood, and children, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. it sort of harkens back to like Ptolemy's. Maybe you're talking about Ptolemy's instructions in Book Three, where he talks about doing the length of life treatment first, so that you know 
so you're not making like wild predictions in the future for somebody that won't live to see it. Yeah. Oh, uh, yes. This is this is part of um, this is a part of the story, and the other part is that um, if uh, you have um, a nice de um, detailed description of uh, different periods of life, then you can you can just uh, compare it to 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 the actual um, uh, CV of the of the native, and and you can make some minor corrections in the life uh, in the uh, timing of birth, maybe. Okay. Um, so, so it has that long section on on primary directions or circumambulations, and then eventually it moves into a different section. And it says, "You must judge each of the stars by their peculiar nature and according to their adherences to the stars, both the wandering and the fixed ones, and the ascending and descending nodes, and according to the qualities of the bounds. And you must give a judgment about how they describe the outcomes in this matter." After this subject, make the ascensions of the signs in accordance with the proper zone, the periods of the stars according to their greatest, middle, and minor years, first by making days, then months, and finally years, and then after this subject, examine the subjects of the conception, the childbirth, and the rest as they are given below in the table. Which is missing. And which is missing. Great. Okay, so the text just like breaks off at this point. Here. And yes. one, one of the things I like when it goes into this section in version one, it's not citing authors, but what's interesting is in version two and in version three, it actually starts citing where some of this is from. And it says in the parallel thing, it, it, the parallel paragraph, it says, you must take the ascensions of the signs in Ptolemy's methods according to the handy tables and in the methods of the Egyptians according to the Egyptian tables and in Valens's methods according to Valens's tables. Um, and then it goes on. It says, "Then make the examination concerning parents following the methods of Ptolemy, Valens, which you have in brackets, and Dorotheus, and following other ancients from the lot lots of parents, and concerning siblings, and following Ptolemy from the third place and the lots of siblings." So it's interesting in the second version, and to a lesser extent the third version, how it's citing specific authors that it's drawing on. Yeah, but um, it is also possible that um, um, actually the the really original version um, had this. Just uh, this version one is is the is the closest to the original in time, but uh, this is not the original one uh, written by this fifth uh, century astrologer. It can easily happen because uh, if we take uh, the uh, the compendium attributed to Raetorius, we will see that. Uh, uh, even the uh, the most um, um, extensive um, form um, is uh, is faulty. So the uh, the names of the the authors are often suppressed and uh, substituted with some uh, very very uh, blank uh, expressions like one wise person or someone or something like that. Why we can see from other versions that there was a name originally. Um, just uh, to give an example, um, you might uh, remember, or the other um, uh, readers, uh, uh, people watching this episode can remember the the episode, uh, the uh, the the chapter of uh, Ray Torius about the uh, about the activities, and there is a um, um, there is a, a short uh, poem um, quoted from Anubio. And some some other views of Anubio are expressed uh, how to how to assess the 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 activities or what what the native does uh, by by looking at uh, uh, the different planets. And here um, in ver in the version uh, in that we can we, we can read in translation, we can see that okay, Anubio says this, but actually this is not the original version. This is a ninth century re revision. What we have actually in the in the earliest uh, in the manuscript of the earliest version is just something that doesn't make sense. There is a word that is doesn't mean anything. So there was something, and someone, a uh, scribe or someone, an editor, just uh, uh, just uh, 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 removed some 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 names from the text for for a known reason. Okay, got it. Um. So towards the end, just to skip a little bit, but there's this nice little section I like where it starts talking about timing techniques again at the end, and it says, 
And version one is just like on, it breaks off, but version two contains one of these last paragraphs and it says, before all, examine the ruler of the year and his position and testimonies and whether he sees his domicile and how he was situated in the birth. So there it's talking about doing annual perfections and identifying the perfected, the ruler of the sign that the perfection has come to as the Lord of the year. Then it says, then examine the hour marker of the year based on the degree of Helios's return, that is from the exact hour of the birth substitute, the Which stars is the solar uh, revolution, actually. Right. So it's talking about the solar revolution. So it's probably drawing on this. This sounds like um, Dorotheus, basically, like Dorotheus's treatment of doing the annual perfected Lord of the Year and also doing the solar return chart at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, then it says, then examine the hour marker of the year based on the degree of the sun's return, that is from the exact hour of the birth substitute. The stars regarding the hour marker and its lord. <clears throat> so it's talking about the stars aspecting the ascendant in the solar return chart, as well as the ruler of the ascendant in the solar return chart as being particularly important. Then, and this is a part that I like, um, it says, then make the distributions of the lots of fortune and daimon or fortune and spirit in the manner of valens the transmissions and acquisitions of the stars as Valens does, and then make the decennials as the Egyptians do, and after these make the distribution of the year. So that, that first little bit was talking about doing zodiac releasing from the lot of spirit and fortune, um, just like Valens does in book four of the anthology. Yes. So I like this because sometimes I've heard people say that like Valens is the only author that talks about zodiac releasing, but in fact, not only was Valens drawing on an earlier author named Abraham for Zodiac releasing, but he gets cited here by some later authors writing in Greek um, as one of those techniques that you should employ in your overall if you're trying to do a comprehensive chart analysis. Yeah, actually, the the author of this this uh, text was uh, um, a fan of Valens. Hmm. Maybe maybe the earliest one. <laughs> maybe the earliest one. Sure. Well. Probably not, because he if Valens lived in the middle of the second century and this person's living in like the late fifth or early sixth century, then somebody passed on Valens's text. That's one of the funny things about Valens's text is he makes you swear an oath three different times to keep the teachings secret, not to share them. But then evidently somebody broke the oath because his book got copied over and got passed on. Otherwise, we we wouldn't have it at this point. Sure, but uh, but uh, you know that um, this uh, there are some obvious uh, uh, signs of uh, of his uh, book uh, having uh, edited, having been edited in in the third century, first because uh, there is a list of, uh, of Roman emperors um, uh, reaching uh, Philip the Arabs, I guess, in the third century. So of course, uh, Valens uh, couldn't have written this part. And um, there are some some um, some appendices um, to the to the book that were just uh, just uh, they uh, contain some nativities from the fifth century, mm. and so it it seems like um, someone just uh, found uh, Valency's notes, uh, which were uh, maybe accumulated uh, just that they had accumulated uh, during the years, and uh, put. Them together, updated some parts, and so even even by the by the fifth century, uh, Valencia's um, uh, work um, had been altered many times. So that's sure. that, that's the point. Maybe some of his students like continued passing on the books and and added to them at different points over the following decades or the following centuries, and then eventually it got more widely circulated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Of course, but uh, the, actually, this is just a pattern that happened to um, us. We can say every other astrological texts, including uh, Ptolemy's uh, Apotelasmatics or Tetrabiblos. Hmm. Okay, so um, that's it for that text. That's just it's just like an overview and a, and a synopsis of every technique. If you wanted to synthesize a bunch of different authors, and in order to do like a full-on chart interpretation. Um, this would be sort of your approach, or this was this author's approach, and it's unique for that reason because you don't usually see a single author trying to combine all these different techniques in terms of how to read a chart. 
Um, but let's move on to the last two texts because I want to make sure we mention these at least briefly before we we wrap up since we're almost at two hours here. Um, the first one nice. is Rhetorius on Inceptions. So this is a text um, from Rhetorius, but it was not translated by um, the previous translators of, of Rhetorius so far, which are James Holden and, and Robert Schmidt. But this is an additional piece that was probably in the Rhetorius compilation that you found? Actually, it was in the Rhetorius compilation, or, or we have a very, very um, compelling evidence for this, because actually one version has Rhetorius as the author in the manuscripts. So we know we need to to uh, uh, to remember that uh, most of the texts uh, um, uh, attributed to Rhetorius actually don't bear the, uh, his name. But he, in this case, uh, there is a very clear uh, attribution to Rhetorius. So and uh, and uh, here uh, the extended version is on the left, and the Rhetorius's version is on the right. And I've got the idea that um, the the extended version is based on the uh, Rhetorius's version. Uh, but um, uh, just to to keep the um, the sequence, I just uh, put the 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 newer version on the left here. Okay, so you've got uh, two parallel columns, and on the left is the extended version. On the right is Rhetorius's version for sure. Um, and so this is a again, it's like a synopsis of putting together a bunch of rules for practicing inceptional astrology or electional astrology. And basically, if you want to pick an electional chart according to Hellenistic rules, these are the um, these are the rules to or the things to look for. Basically, right? Yeah, uh, yes. Yeah, so this is one purpose, but the other purpose is that if if you are um, an analyzing an event chart or or a, or a consultation chart, then of course these are the same guidelines that you should uh, follow. Right. So this is using the the Greek term katarki, which means inception or yes. beginning, beginning or commencement, and the, the Greek term had that dual. Meaning where it could either mean looking at uh, an inception chart for an event that has already started in the past, or looking at or or even picking out a chart that's still coming up in the future. Yes, that's right. Okay. So, all right. So, which one should I read from, or which would you prefer I read from if I read a, like a passage from one, the Rhetorius version or the extended? Oh uh, well, I guess that the um, the Rhetorius version is just okay. Okay, so it says, in every inception, examine the supervisor and the administrator and examine whether they are not subtracting. So uh, it says that the, the supervisor and the administrator, that's the lord of the day, the ruler of the day, and the ruler of the hour, right? Yeah, that's right. So using the planetary ruler of the day, which is, is like um, Sunday, moon day, uh, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, which is Mercury Day, and so on and so forth. So pay attention to what the ruler of the day is and what the ruler of the hour is. Yes. Okay. Then it says, then above all, examine in what sign the hour marker is in a tropical, a double-bodied, or a solid one, and whether it is straight or crooked, moist or aquatic, and so forth. So it says, then look at what the rising sign is, what what sign of the zodiac the hour marker is, and what the quality of that sign is. Mm -hmm. So then it goes on. It says, then examine what appearance the lord of the hour marker has, so the ruler of the ascendant, and whether he is morning, evening, or setting, adding or subtracting, being exalted or depressed, opposing his domicile or in his own domicile or trigon. Pivotal, having declined or succeeding, or by whom he is beheld by a benefic or malefic. So a bunch of conditions there, but basically just looking at establishing what is the condition of the ruler of the ascendant in your inception chart or in your electional chart, and applying all the different core criteria that you would look at, such as um, whether it's a morning star or an evening star, whether it is Fall under the beams. setting yes. under the beams of the sun, whether it's um, moving faster or slower than its average daily motion, or even being retrograde, mm -hmm. wh whether it's in the sign of its exaltation or depression, 
This one's interesting relative to the episode from last month that you helped work on with me, which is he actually explicitly after exaltation or depression stipulates a planet opposing his domicile or being in its own domicile or trigon. So this is once a planet opposing its its domicile or the concept of detriment had started to become fully integrated into the Hellenistic tradition. Rhetorius is using it really explicitly here in electional astrology. Yes. Um, then it says pivotal or having declined or succeeding. So being in an angular house, being in a cadent house, or being in a succeedant house. And then finally, by whom he is beheld, whether by benefics or malefics. So if the planet, if the ruler of the ascendant is being aspected by benefic planets or malefic planets. Yes. So basically, this 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 paragraph just um, is very similar to 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 some some instructions of the previous text of the uh, NATA text. The difference is that um, uh, nativities are always um, uh, so they have a, a bigger importance. In this case, maybe you know the 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 investigation shouldn't go uh, as far as in the case of nativities. Okay. Um, so then it goes on. It says, "Then examine in what place Helios and Selene are, by whom they are beheld, in whose bounds they are, and whether they are in bright degrees." Uh, then it goes on. It says, "Examine in what places the domicile masters of Helios and Selene are, so the the rulers of the sun and moon, or the two luminaries you're supposed to look at, the domicile rulers. What appearances they have, whether they are subtracting or adding." And whether they are looking upon the lights, so whether the domicile lords of the moon, sun and moon or the luminaries are aspecting them, hmm. and in and in particular whether the domicile master of Selene is not opposing Selene, whether he is in a bad or a good place, whether he is be beholding Selene and welcomes the presence of her. Um, what is the term for welcomes the presence of her? Because that's kind of interesting because it almost sounds like reception, which you don't see referenced a lot in the Hellenistic tradition, but then it shows up full-blown in the medieval tradition, and I've been trying to trace where that came in. Yeah, actually, this in this case, the, the welcome um, could be translated uh, uh, as receive. Uh, this uh, The key word is um, which means to receive, um, or it can also mean receive, but there is another um, um, a cognate uh, verb that is, um, I guess, it is apodekhumai, and which has a very similar meaning. But um, as it seems that uh, these rarely used uh, verbs in Greek have a different meaning. So um, while in this uh, this welcome um, means simply uh, to be um, bodily uh, applied. Um, by another uh, planet. So when th there is an application uh, from, the, from the moon, and this is the planet that is just waiting for the application, and uh, there, is the other, um, there is the other verb that is um, receive, and this uh, other verb receive uh, uh, expresses exactly what is reception in the later uh, uh, tradition. So being, uh, uh, being a guest in someone's domicile. But this is yeah. a different verb. I mean, because it's still like when you look at the parallel from the extended version, it says it because it's talking about the 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 ruler of the sign that the moon is placed in, basically. And it says in the extended version, examine in particular whether the domicile master of the moon is not opposing the moon, whether he lies in a good place, and whether he is beholding her in any way except by a, a diameter, by an opposition, and whether he welcomes her presence. Um, it's pretty close to the concept of reception, so I wonder if this isn't where it's already no, in the I, tradition. Actually, I, th I think it is. Um, it is um, so the reception is a bigger set. In this case, so we are dealing with a very, spe very special meaning, which means that it is not just uh, reception and uh, having a configuration, but uh, the the ruler and and the moon are together uh, in a sign. So this is a bodily uh, uh, conjunction, also. Okay, got it. Um, so then the text of Rhetorius gets a little choppy, and it looks like it breaks off. Um, and it says, and whether Selene is waxing in her light or waning, 
and whether she is adding in numbers or subtracting. Um, it keeps going on. Examine in which place the lot of fortune is and whether the sun is beholding it, for it brings success and choices. Uh, examine the lord of the lot of fortune and consider the applications and separations of Selene. And it, it keeps going with a bunch of different things, including looking at the nodes. But this kind of gives you a really good overview. It's like it's almost like Rhetorius is summarizing all of the electional rules from Book Five of Dorotheus, which is really useful because Dorotheus does a pretty good job of like um, going through different topics and telling you what to look at, um, but isn't as clear about like outlining a systematic approach for looking at every inceptional chart right from the start, at least in the surviving version. Yeah, well, it seems that um, um, this uh, this uh, author who 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 wrote uh, these texts uh, was uh, uh, devoted to systemizing the uh, the the whole tradition. So mm. to 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 put together texts that uh, just uh, tell how to how to do this uh, or how to do that in a systematic way. There is a third text that is uh, uh, retributed to Rhetorius, and uh, this was uh, uh, this has already been translated. This is a um, so called um, um, tabular um, um, investigation. I think this would be uh, examination, tabular uh, examination. That would be the best uh, 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 translation for that. This is a. Uh, uh, this was translated by Holden. Uh, I think it is uh, chapter uh, fifty-seven uh, in the in the um, in this translation. And there is another version that is um, uh, found in the um, in the book of Hermes. You know the Liber Hermetis. Uh, translated by by Robert Zoller, okay. and uh, and I guess that um, that was a synoptic version translated by Robert Schmidt um, in in, a, in in one booklet. But um, so so this could be even um, improved, and there is also a systematic um, uh, uh, examination of uh, of the luminaries of uh, the Trigon Lords. Of the of the uh, the basic lots of the um, uh, prenatal syzygy, um, uh, the lunar nodes, and something like that. So it's about the uh, general assessment of of uh, of the of the success and the um, of the fame and and rank of the native. Yeah, that would be a great thing to translate at some point. So that's definitely on your list of things to do mm -hmm. one of these days. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Um, all right, let's quickly move on to our last text, and and this one's really good because it demonstrates we're we're kind of jumping over all over the place to different eras in Hellenistic astrology. First with Antiochus in like the first or second century, and Porphyry maybe if it was even authored by Porphyry in the third century or so. Then we've jumped to Rhetorius and Zeno's astrologer, where Zeno's astrologer is in the fifth century, and Rhetorius might be in the in the sixth or seventh century. Um, but there's not the the Greek texts were not just um, restricted to that era where we typically think of the Hellenistic tradition from the first century BC until the sixth or seventh century CE. But instead, um, Greek ancient Greek continued to be used in the Byzantine tradition for several centuries after that, and astrologers continued to. Write texts and copy over and preserve different texts, and in some instances, even translated texts from Arabic into Greek. Right? That's right. Yeah. The only problem is that um, in a lot of cases, there are um, so the authors, the original authors, are not indicated. Uh, we know that um, but there are um, a handful of uh, of um, Arabic authors uh, appearing in in these late uh, sources. But uh, there are many, many chapters that we we, we can we can suspect that this is something uh, coming from the Arabic astrology, but we don't know about the authors, unfortunately. Yeah, okay. but in this case, we know the author and and uh, and also the uh, whereabouts of the text. <laughs> okay, so the so the fourth text you're releasing today is a work in progress where. It is a translation from a student of the famous 9th century astrologer Abu Mashar, um, who was one of the most prolific medieval astrological authors and, and influential math, uh, astrological authors. And I've interviewed Benjamin Dykes about him last summer. 
uh, and probably will again before too long because Ben said in the last episode that he's finishing his translation of Abu Mashar's greater introduction right now. Um, so Abu Mashar lived in the ninth century, and he had this um, student named Shadan who wrote this text where he uh, seems like he just wrote down a bunch of different anecdotes from his time studying with his teacher and some of the things that his teacher Abu Mashar told him, which makes it an extraordinarily um, unique document that you don't usually see in the astrological tradition, um, but also very interesting as sort of like a behind the scenes look into the the life and the thinking of Abu Mashar. Yes, that's it. Uh, I guess this is the best description. Okay, so um, so what this is is that text that was originally written by Shadan in Arabic in the ninth century. At some yes. point, it was translated into Greek, right? Yeah. Well, we don't know exactly the the time of the translation and the name of the translator because um, these um, these late translator didn't uh, uh, want to be exposed. Uh, but we can we can suspect that the, this translation was made around the uh, around the year one thousand, so maybe in the tenth or the eleventh centuries. Uh, it is not a complete translation of the complete Arabic text. Well, I as far as I know the so th there is no edition of the uh, the Arabic text. And as far as I know, there are uh, maybe two different versions of the Arabic original that uh, is also extant. And uh, this Greek version um, is only a partial uh, translation, but um, well, it, it, it contains about 60, 70, 70, 80% of the, of the Arabic versions, according to Pingree, who wrote an, an article about that. And uh, it uh, and this Greek version also has a um, has a Latin translation. Um, it is uh, extant in ma many manuscripts, and it is very important to look at these manuscripts because uh, the uh, the Byzantine uh, Greek version is only extant in in uh, in three primary manuscripts, and sometimes they are they are sort of faulty. So we need uh, every 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 witness to to put together the whole picture. Um, of course, so, but the, uh, anti the, the Arabic is translated. So, but the the Greek version was translated directly from the Arabic. But I think you said that the Latin version was translated from the Greek version, right? Yes, but um, well, it is not me who's saying that, but uh, Pingree. But um, with it looks quite obvious. Sure, I guess I was just saying in terms of the importance then of of having a translation of the Greek version. Um, and studying it, so I've I've been encouraging like Ben to translate the Arabic version, and I think he's going to do that at some point. But once you finish this, I think this will be the first full translation of this text that's been published, and you've completed about a third of it, and you've been slowly releasing it to your patrons and supporters through your page on Patreon over the past few months, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yes. Um, um, for a while, I I wanted to. To uh, to release uh, new uh, uh, installments every week, but uh, now I just uh, release some new installments every second week. Uh, I I'm trying to finish uh, this text as soon as possible, but of course there are many other texts that I I need to deal with. Sure. Um, well, I just wanted to read through a few highlights that you have so far, since it's still a work in progress. There's a few really good. Um, Parts of this just to give people a taste for what it's about and what um, the text is like. So, first, I wanted to take a look at um, passage three. So, this is funny. It's like a classic um, anecdote that Abu Mashar told his student once about giving advice to somebody and some of the pitfalls of talking to non astrologers. So, um, here it is. It's titled the 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 title is when the moon was in square with Mars, the traveler to whom an inception was made met robbers. So the text says, Abu Mashar said, once I was traveling to Baghdad with some fellow travelers, and in Ray I met a friend having some knowledge of astrology, who asked me how the moon was the following day. I told him she was in square with Mars. He replied. Then you will not depart tomorrow. I told him, believe me, I am not at all eager to depart on a day like that, but my cattle drivers will not listen to us. 
He suggested we test them, so I said to the drivers, Men, tomorrow it is a bad day. Be patient, I shall feed your animals. They were not convinced, so I let them depart and stayed with my friend. As they were about to leave, I took the Ascendant, and I found it was in Taurus, and Mars was in it while the moon was in Leo in square with Mars. So I told them, for God's sake, do not leave at this hour. But they laughed at me and left. I told my friend, believe me, I feel sorry for these foolish people, and we sat down to eat and drink. We were still drinking when certain men of the caravan arrived wounded. They had encountered robbers who killed some of them and wounded the others, and the robbers had driven away all the animals they were driving. The survivors attacked me with stones and staffs, saying, These things happened because of your superstition so that you can confirm your utterance. I barely survived the attack, and I swore I would never disclose any astrological wisdom to an ignoramus. <laughs> so that's a that's a great um, anecdote of this must be like a real, sounds like a real life anecdote of Abu Mashar paying attention to on a regular daily basis, like what's going on with the electional astrology and specifically once he gave advice to these people and they wouldn't listen to him, he cast the inception chart or the electional chart for when they departed on their journey. And he saw that um, Taurus was rising and Mars was in Taurus in the first house and that the moon was in Leo squaring Mars. So it was kind of like a worst case scenario in terms of, of electional astrology at that point. Yeah. Yes, it seems. Of course, uh, we, we we can't exclude the possibility that uh, Abu Mashar was uh, was exaggerating because uh, this is uh, secondhand information. So uh, he says, "Okay, I met a friend that this tells to his pupil, uh, a devoted pupil, Shadan, and of course uh, we just uh, know it from him." Yeah, but uh, but it's interesting to 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 see it behind this behind the scenes, I guess, and then to see that. Uh, uh, well, uh, these practicing astrologers, even the biggest ones, the greatest ones, like uh, Abu Mashar himself, was uh, much uh, like us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've uh, you know, as somebody who's been doing electional astrology for the past fifteen years or so, um, if I saw you know, if I, I've paid attention to charts like that, and if you have like Mars in the first house in an electional chart, and the Moon is applying to a square with Mars in a day chart. You're going to have a bad time, and that's that's a pretty straightforward like electional rule that most electional astrologers, I think, will get on board with pretty easily. So, you know, maybe it was a little exaggerated, but on the other hand, this could have actually been a real life anecdote of, of something I could have seen happening, just because I've sort of seen things like that myself, um, just in terms of my own like endeavors and leaving on trips and things like that when you have no choice. All right, so that's one of the excerpts. Um, Another one that I found interesting that I wanted to read is the very next one, passage four, which is titled, When Saturn is in conjunction with Jupiter, if someone is born who has the sign of this conjunction in the ascendant or midheaven, this one will be a great king. So it says, Abu Mashar said, quote, The conjunctions of Saturn and Jupiter bear great mysteries. If someone is born on the day of this, uh, this conjunction, and his ascendant or midheaven happens to be in the same sign as the conjunction, a great king will be born whose name will be known all over the world. So I thought that was really interesting, of course, because we are in a year of 2020 where we're coming up on a conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn really soon. And the question of, you know, what happens if somebody is born at that time with Jupiter Saturn conjunction, conjunct their ascendant or conjunct their midheaven or what have you. Well, we'll see. Yeah, we'll have to find in 20, out. We'll, in 30 years, maybe. <laughs> yeah, 30 years, 40 years, we'll see what happens. Um, mm -hmm. All right, so another one that I wanted to read was passage 23 about if you're going to the caliph, which is something we all find ourselves doing from time to time. So it says yeah. when you're about to Right, you did the other day. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. When you're about to go to the caliph who wants to use your knowledge of astrology, it says, He also told me in Baghdad, so this is Shadan talking about, I must have been like studying with Abu Mashar in Baghdad in the ninth century, which is just really cool to think of. It says, He also told me in Baghdad, quote, 
If the caliph takes you so that you serve him with your knowledge of astrology, do not make a judgment when the ascendant is in Scorpio or the angles are in movable signs or Mars is angular, because the judgment will be mistaken and because Scorpio is a sign of falsity. So this is one of the funny, I remember reading Ben's translation of the Latin version of Shadan's um, anecdotes, and it's like a recurring theme that Abu Mashar was not a fan of the sign Scorpio, and he kept associating it with like deception and falsity. Yeah, but I don't, I don't think that it, it was it was him to to do it uh, for the first time. Uh, right. Yeah. Well, I, well, I, well, I, well, I okay, I'm, I'm not a, not a, a walking encyclopedia, but uh, uh, maybe uh, there are uh, many um, earlier texts. Uh, Including the, the the one that is attributed to to Rhetorius uh, about the description of signs and or or the one that is uh, um, the pr- present in Valence and you know that there are different um, uh, classifications of signs and one of these fla- classifications can be real weird like uh, uh, like um, enigmatic or obscure signs you know. Um, um, convex signs, or I don't know, some sort of signs, and 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 can be some force signs or 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 yeah. mendacious signs. So I guess that this this also part of the story. Uh, what is interesting is that uh, that Abu Mashar gives this uh, this uh, uh, suggestion to the to the student, and it is not a theoretical uh, recommendation. It is no. not like oh yeah well yeah because uh, he uh, this or that writes this but no when you know you go to the caliph and you're playing with your life basically because if the caliph doesn't like your prediction or you just uh, give uh, uh, bad uh, uh, predictions and and these are faulty then maybe your uh, your head can say goodbye to your neck so don't do that because you need to be careful and this is something that you need to take care of. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about like a. This is the time period when astrologers were acting still as advisors for kings and for the rulers, and sometimes making really important decisions or advising them on important decisions. And it had, you know, they they were not just like doing delineations of like their love life or something like that, mm, um, exactly. but like timing wars and campaigns and the founding of cities. Like Baghdad itself was founded. Uh, based on an electional chart put together by a group of astrologers, so he's saying he's giving indications for be careful not to give advice under certain conditions. Like if Mars is angular, because your your judgment, your prediction might be wrong in that instance. So you want to want to be paying attention to those things. Yeah, that's right, and not just that. That was always a risky business because uh, there is a, there is another chapter that I haven't translated so far, but. Uh, um, I remember Abu Mashar saying that uh, once he was punished by the caliph by predicting something that was right, just the caliph didn't like it. <laughs> okay. Oh, right. Okay. Um, let's see. There's so there's just two more, two more um, passages that I wanted to read. One of them is twenty four, which is if someone wants to travel for his profit, how the horoscope should have its configurations. It says, he also told me another secret. When you want to travel for profit, make the lord of the second house be above the earth, separate from a a malefic star, or a star made infortunate, or a declining star, and apply to an angular benefic in mutual reception, because the trip will be of the greatest profit. I add the following, the lord of the second house must not be in its fall, burned up, or retrograde because these conditions cause hindrance. That's interesting, Shadan, you know, giving an anecdote from his teacher, but then also adding his own observation at the end as well. Here, yes. Sometimes it happens, yeah. Um, and then finally, the last one that I thought was interesting was uh, passage 28. It says, he said when Saturn is in Libra and Jupiter is in Cancer, they always affect great changes in the world. Uh, and I just thought that was really interesting and weird because uh, a few months ago I did the episode with Nina Griffin on the founding of the birth chart for the United States, which just weirdly happened to be founded in a year when Jupiter was in Cancer and Saturn was in Libra, which are the signs of their exaltations. So it's interesting 
this like ninth century astrologer mentioning something like that, and then you have an event like that that correlates several centuries after the author died, uh, for whatever that's worth. Yeah, well, this is really remarkable, I guess. But it's interesting because in this case, uh, this is an isolated statement, so we don't know, we don't learn anything more about the the, the background or the context. And sometimes it is really frustrating to see that the, these um, these um, uh, memories of uh, Shazan are just uh, like, uh, okay, I just heard something interesting, and I just uh, wrote down the, this very sentence, and we don't know about the the background, the why. So, what are the the limits of these sort of things? Yeah, but still, it's it's interesting to see that uh, this is how 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 as the astrological scene looked like in the ninth century. Yeah, definitely, and it's interesting because it's behind the scenes of it's not just the the theoretical text of like what you're publishing and saying this is how it works in theory, but some of it is you know real life anecdotes about things that made a difference or that were like learned lived experiences perhaps that Abu Mashar may have had. Yes, yeah. So that's why I I just found it in so. I guess in this case, uh, so in, a, in the case of this present text of uh, Shadan's um, um, uh, discourses, I could have waited until until Bandai's can 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 put this uh, Arabic text uh, on his schedule, but I just wanted to to bring it uh, uh, to the to the um, to the people interested in in the practical side of astrology to see what what was happening then. So of course, uh, my my translation will be. Uh, superseded by by Ben's uh, translation eventually, uh, but the 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 very same reasons um, uh, motivate me when I'm I'm uh, focusing on on uh, translating actual uh, casebook uh, nativities or inceptions that haven't been translated or or edited so far. So, for example, uh, some um, uh, for example the the nativity of the uh, Byzantine emperor uh, Constantine the seventh. Uh, that is a detailed uh, description, uh, uh, delineation uh, using the methods of uh, Dorotheus and, and Ptolemy. Um, so these are very important. But you see that there is a whole range from the theoretical, uh, purely theoretical, and uh, to the to the actual practical examples that uh, that can be translated. Yeah. Well, um, it seems like you're covering the entire spectrum, and and especially as you go on. More and more with your translations, we'll be able to see more and more of that. I know translating some of the horoscopes of different um, authors, different Greek horoscopes and delineations that were written in Greek is also something you're very interested in. Um, so, just to wrap up the Shadan piece, um, this is about you're about a third of the way through translating this, but you're going to be, like you said, every other week, you're going to continue releasing more, more passages from this translation. Through your page on Patreon for subscribers that want to sign up for that. So right now the goal is to fund the project so that you can keep translating all the time. So I want to encourage everybody that listened to this episode and was interested in anything that we we're talking about to go to your page on Patreon and fund it because I want to see you translate more of these texts and eventually, maybe you know, however many years in the future, we'll have all of the surviving texts translated. And then we can we can study them and piece through them and and learn from them and recover a lot of the sort of knowledge that's locked away in some of these techniques uh, in these texts or that has been locked away for centuries now. Um, so patrons get early access to texts like this as well as updates um, plus other benefits. You're still in the process of expanding the different benefits that people get at this point, right? Sure. Um, I just wanted to to start uh, translating and releasing translations as soon as possible uh, before setting up a devoted web page that uh, you can find all the translations and then uh, you can you can have a login and then you can access uh, them in a, in a convenient format and also before uh, before uh, providing um, uh, any sort of ideas uh, or any sort of uh, special benefits to 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 um, to, to to the generous uh, subscribers, but I'm just uh, planning to to set up uh, uh, different ideas. Um, so I'm I'm trying to um, so while I'm I'm focusing primarily on translations, and of course uh, anyone who has ever uh, tried to translate texts uh, must know that um, translation is a very time-consuming business. 
especially in the case of Greek texts, when you just don't sit down and, and, and start translating, but you need to compare different versions, different texts, different authors, think about um, the meaning of some passages. So, um, so the, the output is, of course, it is meager compared to uh, modern uh, language translations uh, between uh, some modern languages. So while I'm, I'm I'm focusing primarily to the translations, I'm trying to 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 figure out how I can I can uh, benefit the uh, the 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 patrons. Uh, so with the in, on different tiers, yes. Yeah. Well, there's been some exciting ideas. I mean, you're making some of these PDFs available. Uh, you're going to set up a library of texts that people can download eventually. You're you're in the process of working on your. Website, which is horiproject.com. Um, but in the meantime, the primary site um, is your Patreon page, which is available at patreon.com slash horiproject. You also have a page on Facebook where you release updates, and you also started an account on Twitter where you've been occasionally posting some little updates and snippets as well, which I've appreciated. Um, and then eventually, in the long term, you have future plans to publish. Um, some of these translations in book form at some point as well, right? Yeah, but I guess that um, um, the time of book format only comes when um, uh, there are some uh, well-established uh, um, uh, translation versions uh, of, uh, of, uh, of particular texts. And just to uh, I'll give an example, so when, for example, we, we started talking about the, the porphyry text, and when the Porphyry text uh, together with uh, the Antiochus summary and some Rhetorius passages, so and uh, some other basic texts uh, can be translated together and can be put together, and there can be a, a commentary that uh, gives an insight uh, into the uh, the usage of different concepts in different uh, authors, and also can give some practical examples. So when there is a comprehensive handbook, I think this is the time when it can be published in a book format. Okay. Or something like um, that. That sounds good. So besides um, finishing Shadan and finishing soon the Porphyry and Antiochus translation, what are some of your other long-term projects? We talked about maybe translating like Paulus Alexandrinus's introduction at some point, since that's a text that's not as in circulation as as I might like personally. It's another good introductory text. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, well, Paulus um, is, is um, definitely worth uh, translating, uh, especially as the, the all the previous translations were made from a um, uh, critical edition uh, published in the 1950s before the uh, before before the paradigm shift in in uh, making uh, uh, critical editions. So. Mm, so I guess that I can I can come up with some 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 better text uh, that is um, uh, translated so far. Uh, so, but just having the the opportunity to look at the uh, the, the relevant manuscripts a little bit more closely, mm -hmm. and I'm also tr um, um, planning to translate um, uh, this uh, text I mentioned about um, uh, related to to. Uh, to Rhetorius about this um, um, tabular examination, and also the this, this basics that constitutes the the, the, the beginning of uh, on the celestial disposition, because all, it is also uh, an introductory text, and uh, and uh, in so during the the, the project uh, my project uh, with uh, Porphyry. I've already translated most of it, so I just need to to translate a couple of more uh, chap uh, chapters from that. And um, so I would like to I would like to um, to to have a sort of a, a healthy balance uh, between uh, the different um, uh, eras, different genres of these texts. So some inception, some nativity, some. Um, um, annual methods, uh, so natal um, uh, uh, prediction, maybe some mundane ast astrology, some practical examples, this and that. But uh, it's I'm, I don't have uh, so besides uh, Paulus, I don't have any any sort of a, a big uh, text in in front of me that I would like to translate. But maybe focusing on on different uh, uh, minor texts that that are worth uh, looking at. Yeah, well, there's plenty of work to do. 
Uh, but basically, so so you promise if we if the astrological community funds this, you're going to do your best to just translate as many texts as you can and to make them available to the world. Basically, you're not going to yeah. change your mind like some of their translation projects and stop publishing suddenly. I, you'll probably. Well, I don't think so because, um, as you mentioned at the beginning, I'm a classical philologist and um, I'm doing my PhD in the topic of. of uh, the textual transmission of astrological texts um, in Hellenistic times or late Hellenistic times, but I'm also interested in in um, in the later uh, uh, periods of astrology uh, up to the Middle Ages. Um, I think there is a so there is a vast reservoir of uh, of uh, uh, untouched, uh, undiscovered texts and. Mm. Uh, and this is actually my profession to deal with text. So this is what I'm spe specialized in, uh, to mm -hmm. deal with with uh, astrological texts written in in Greek or uh, written in in Latin. So I think um, you know this is this is what, how can I say? It? So this is where I, what the, my 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 the goal of my life. <laughs> yeah, I mean I, that's great. I think that's a great way to say it. And um, yeah, so I'm I'm excited about it. I hope that people. Will help to fund help me to fund this project so we can get the rest of these texts translated. Uh, there's the website again, Patreon.com/horiproject, and you can um, pick a different pledge level to support each month, mo each month, and get full access or early access to some of these texts. Um, yeah, so so I hope I wish you great great luck and great success in this project, and thank you already for the work that you've done uh, translating you. some of these texts and making them available. And um, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for joining me today. I appreciate it. I thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks everybody for listening to this episode of the Astrology Podcast. Uh, be sure to check out some of the links in the description below this episode, where I'll put links to all the translations we were talking about today. And otherwise, uh, that's it. So thanks for listening, and we'll see you again next time. Thanks to the patrons who helped to support the production of this episode of the Astrology Podcast through our page on Patreon.com. In particular, shout out to patrons Christine Stone, Nate Craddock, Marin Altman, Arena Tudor, Thomas Miller, Bear River, Catherine Conroy, Michelle Marillat, and Kate Pallotta. As well as the Astrogold Astrology app available at astrogold.io, the Portland School of Astrology at portlandastrology.org, and the Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanacs available at honeycomb.co. The production of this episode of the podcast was also supported by the International Society for Astrological Research, which is hosting an online astrology conference September 12th and 13th, 2020. You can find out more information about that at isar2020.org. And finally, also Solar Fire Astrology Software, which is available at alabe.com, and you can use the promo code AP15 for a 15% discount on that software. For more information about how to become a patron of the Astrology Podcast and help support the production of future episodes while getting access to subscriber benefits like early access to new episodes or other bonus content, go to patreon.com slash astrologypodcast.